Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the December 12th Board of Education meeting for Saline Area Schools. So standing as you were or able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, as led by Brad Gerby. Thank you, Brad, once again. You don't really push back about against being, about being asked to do that, so. I'm glad to do that. Awesome. Um, I'd like to uh, pass over the microphone for a second or two to uh, Superintendent Lott. She has two state. Okay, thanks very much. I'd like to first uh, introduce Carol Baki Diglio, who come to, comes to us as our interim assistant superintendent of human resources. She's going to come up to the microphone and just say hello, but she comes with great experience both as um, she's had many roles, but she's been a high school principal, uh, human resources in Novi, and most recently in Oak Park, and so she's already a wonderful addition to the team. Oh, it needs to be uh, press the push button to get to you the You got it. I'm used to hot mics. Um, I just want to thank, for, thank you for the opportunity. This is a beautiful school district, and the well, warm welcome that I've received in the last five days has been amazing. The administrative staff, the core team, just uh, I'm getting acclimated, trying to get out to buildings, meet as many people as I can, and it's just been a wonderful welcome. So I thank Steve and his leadership and the leaders here in the buildings. Um, I'm going to continue to try and get around it. I'm just grateful to be here. Uh, this is my 34th, 35th year in education. And as Steve mentioned, I've been everything from a teacher through assistant superintendent. And I've done some consulting with other districts along the way. So thank you for having me. And thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Carol. OK. okay. Uh, next, I would like to uh, introduce the Saline High School Girls Swim and Dive Team. This is part of the superintendent's recognition. I'm going to read a brief statement, and then we're going to have the whole team come up. Uh, the 2023 Girls Swim and Dive Team, coached by Todd Brunty, Kara Smith, Alan Dusky, and Eli Machado, and led by senior captains Ellie Brunty, Nora McGillicuddy, and Nani Sana. They finished the season with a 9-1 dual meet record, a second-place finish at the SEC Championship, and a fourth-place finish at the MHSAA Finals. Ellie Brunty, Mary Baldwin, Lindy Jenkins, Maggie Kaiser, Joanne Oyemba, Nani Sana, and Anna, Anna Serbu earned all state honors. So I'd like to welcome the girls swim and dive team led by Coach Brunty up to the microphone and they're gonna introduce themselves and their roles and then we're gonna take a picture with the Board of Education over on the far side of the room. So we'll kick it off with Coach Brunty. I think the microphone may be on, we'll have to see. If it's, if it's on, well you gotta press the button to get it to go green. All right, well, thank you all for having us here tonight and recognizing us uh, as a team. Uh, really important for us, and we really appreciate it because I know this group of, of young people here really do a fine job of representing this community and everything it's striving for. We take pride in being able to do that for the community and to represent all of you, and I think we've done a good job of that. I'm very proud of them, and we just I just want to say thank you for recognizing that, and it's been a great opportunity to represent the community, so thank you. Hi, I'm Nani Sana, and I'm a senior captain. <laughs> I'm Ellie Brunty, I'm also a senior and a captain. I'm Alex Lilly, and I'm a sophomore, and I'm just a swimmer, I'm not captain. <laughs> Alex, Alex, could you just move, move the mic down, down just there a there. Okay, that's good. I'm Lindy Jenkins, and I am a three-time All-State diver. <laughs> I'm Kathy Sue, I'm a senior, and I'm a swimmer. I'm Victoria Whedon, and I'm a senior swimmer. 
Hi, I'm Nora McGillicuddy, and I'm a senior captain. We're getting this recognition thing down to a science. Right. Thank you. Uh, so this is, uh, we are now at the uh, public comment time. A mem member of the public may address the board briefly for up to three minutes or request to be scheduled on the agenda of a future meeting. Please note that students will be given priority to speak on any topic. The first public participation portion of the meeting will be limited to one half hour, 30 minutes normally, and limited to agenda items. A second public participation portion will be offered at the end of the agenda to allow for any further comment or any other comment. Individuals addressing the board should take into consideration rules of common courtesy. The public participation portion of the meeting cannot be used to make personal attacks against a board member, district employee, or student. We have uh, we allow students to go first. We have Alex Lilly who was here moments ago. Oh, and still is here. Alex, if you're, if you're new to this, uh, 30 seconds before the time is up, uh, Secretary Miller will hold up a yellow card, and when your time is up, when your three minutes is up, she'll hold up the red card, at which point a man with a hook will come out. And <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Hello, all. My name is Alex Lilly, and I am a student at Saline High School, and I've, I, I have attended Saline area schools for most of my life. I'm also a transgender male who is a two-sport varsity athlete, as I play for the girls' water polo team and swim for the swim and dive team. This makes me one of the very few transgender athletes at Saline. Last year, during gym class, I discovered that there were several issues with the gender-neutral locker rooms. First, the main door was regularly locked, so I had to ask a coach or a gym teacher to use it, unlike the cisgender students. Second, the signage did not follow the school's new inclusive policy as it said family locker rooms and not all gender locker rooms. This makes it seem as if there is no place for gender non-conforming students or swimmers of both Saline and other schools in the school area. Third, all of the stalls in the locker room had locks that were either missing or broken. And lastly, people were using the locker room as a walkway to get from the hallway to the pool deck. I informed Shannon Washington and Ashley Mantha of these issues in March of 2023. And after seeing no changes, my parents then raised the issue to Superintendent Latch in September of 2023. And he has been following up with, the, with those issues since. Thank you for that. I wanted to bring my story here because this is an example of how the needs of trans and non-binary students are underrepresented at Saline Area Schools. I want to be sure that all of our trans and non-binary students can be athletes if they wish to be, and locker rooms are an important starting point. Going forward, to help voice these needs, I plan to start a club at Saline High School. The goal of the club will be to the focus on trans and non-binary specific issues within the school, athletics, clubs, and student leadership, as well as logistical issues with power school and standardized testing that I have encountered. I would like this club to report out to the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee for this board, and I hope I have your support in making this happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Chen Ming Fan. Unless you're on for, yep. Thank 
now it's the third. But everybody can hear me. Anyway, yeah. thank you. I'm so glad Mr. McVeigh want to continue to serve us as the volunteer, M-A-S-B word. So this is what I feel is great for him to lead us, to serve us, and also to be with us at a difficult time. It is very important, not only for this area, Region 7, but I think it is a bigger area involved with the, all of the things in America education system, not just high school and also the higher education. As you know that three of the presidents of the Ever League, one resigned, the other two, who knows? So we have big problem. Houston, we have big problem in education. So they, please, do your best. Second thing I want to share with you about the education system compared with Chinese and American. I think it is the problem of this country. We got to have some catch up. The technology go faster, faster. However, we have big problem between the have and have not. So AI and also environmental issues. How much we have been teaching our people here about environment how we cannot match with the White House and lands in the government. And our governor raised these challenges, 2015 net zero. How many students of you really participate in this? That's one thing important. Thirdly, I think wonderful people, two volunteers sit over there, represent this student body. I met them and volunteer, collect the cardboard. So this is something which is still then so important. I would say we should have three rather than two, let alone previous one have one. Why three? I think they deserve one vote. The president can decide, the board can decide, but three of them can vote some important issues. So this is my suggestion. Do I have five seconds or less? Five seconds. So. I really want to thank you so much. I might be wrong, but I think this is the time to change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fan. I'd like to introduce Kara Stemmer, the director of the South and West Washtenaw Consortium, who has an extended comment period. Yep. Thank you. So, yes, I'm Kara Stummer, new to this role. Um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the consortium. We have a couple new people, so I just wanted to review uh, what the SWWC is. It stands for the South and West Washington Consortium. Uh, we serve six districts, Chelsea, Dexter, Lincoln, Manchester, Milan, and Saline. Currently, I'm proud to say we have 934 students enrolled in our career and technical education classes, 22 programs, um, and I would say the majority of them are housed at Celine High School. We have four of the courses offered over at Chelsea High School and then two at Dexter. Um, of those 934 students, I would say 50, 54% are Celine students. Um, let's see. So we just, a little update, uh, we're excited to share that we just finished our recruiting trail, as I call it. So we spent a few days in November visit, uh, visiting the other schools and speaking to their 10th graders and introducing them to the opportunities of the consortium. And just talk to, talking to them, showing them our video about what CTE is and how it can impact their lives. So we spent some time doing that. In fact, um, tomorrow we're addressing the juniors at Celine as well. Um, we, last week on Thursday, we also offered tours. So we had the schools bring their 10th graders to Celine High School, and they chose their top two programs, and they could tour them by our student leaders from the South and West Washington Consortium um, Student Council. So that was exciting, good opportunity for leadership. We finished our, or I'm hopeful I, I, some of you attended our third annual um, open house, which we anticipated had about 1,000 people that attended. This was an opportunity for 
business and industry people to register and basically seek families or talk to families and students about the opportunities of career and technical education and what that looks like when a student uh, graduates or leaves one of our programs. So that was exciting. We also had our staff on hand and students could uh, visit the programs and um, just ask questions. It was more or less our open house. So great uh, turnout for that. It was an exciting night for us. Uh, the last Friday, uh, we opened our applications already. So thinking about next year, we're just still, I feel like starting this year, but so we've started the 24-25 application process and that opened at eight o'clock on Friday. And I'm proud to say we already have 271 applications. So um, that's exciting and we anticipate uh, more to come, but that was a nice, a nice introduction to, um, their, to show their excitement. If anyone has any more um, you know, questions or wants to look further into the consortium, we have, I just wanna share our website, which is www.vswwc. Thank you. Very much, we appreciate it. Well, that's a new trend, having applause after every speaker. Is I, almost, I sort of like it. <laughs> Showing respect, appreciate that, thank you. Um, I'd like to, uh, say I have no response to previous public comment. Uh, we are now at the uh, revisions or approval of the agenda. Items can be added or deleted from the agenda and or the order of items can be changed at the request of an individual board member or the superintendent. The agenda must be approved before proceeding further. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the agenda as printed. So moved, Stebbin. So moved, Stebbin. Supported by Gerby. Assuming there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. We have an agenda. Um, I'd now like to, are you going to be doing the, introducing the uh, student showcase? Um, no, no, we'll go ahead and do that. During our board meetings, we'd like to introduce uh, some interesting things that are going on in our students' lives. And tonight we have the Celine High School eSports team. Uh, and the presenters are, I'm sure they're going to introduce themselves, but I'll just run their names by Griffin Berwick, Nick Graydon, Marco Matthews, Ben Burke, Jackson Cravens, Dylan uh, Tatman, is it? And yeah. Steve, pardon? Yeah. You got it. Hey, cool. And Steve Vassiloff running the show. So come on up, folks, and tell us about eSports. All right. Thank you. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and you say that's yeah. unfortunate? Thank you very much. Well, we'll let you. So we are the Celine Esports team, and this is our fall 2023, 2023 season recap. So, oh wait, do I have a, oh, sweet. So we in total had 27 members across seven teams, which we also had four different games, which was Rocket League, League of Legends, Mario Kart, and Super Smash Bros. The, our overall record was 42 and 24, which is a overall winning record, obviously, which is pretty good. Now, the overall mission of the Selene Esports is to unite the gaming community at Selene High School and try to support the collegiate esports and grow uh, the next generation of leaders. We really work to accomplish this by creating a very inclusive and open, supportive environment where all students can express their passion for gaming and as well as increasing their skills. We feel that it is very important for our students uh, to be given an opportunity to pursue the creation of um, memorable experiences such as going to states and competing in in-person areas. Um, we believe that we can accomplish this by continuing to develop a student-led and student-centered esports team uh, at Selene High School. So the first game that we'll be presenting is Rocket League, which is the managed by me. We had two different teams. The first team was me, uh, McCall Hamid, Mason Dykstraus, and Jeff Denu Daniel. Our final record was nine and two, and we finished top eight in the state, only one game away from competing in the in-persons. Uh, and the second team consisted of uh, Bregan uh, uh, Craig, Carter Chapel, Alex Liu, and Brahima Sissoko. Their final record was five and four, and they placed top 32 in the state. Now, originally when uh, I joined the Selene Esports team, it started with just like a hobby that I do when I was at home, just playing with friends. And when I found out that Selene was making an esports team, I thought, why not join for fun? Another big reason was Jeff Denu Daniel pictured there with the white sweatshirt. Um, he didn't have a computer. He wasn't really able to play video games. And so this was a very big opportunity for him to just join the team and be able to play with his friends and play where he normally wasn't able to. Um, 
And while I joined the team, I wasn't expecting to make any new friends, just kind of play with my own friends. But I met uh, Bregan and Carter, who are freshmen, and I never suspected as a senior to make freshman friends. And well, I guess some things turn out how you don't expect it. And so I made a lot of different friends with Bregan, Bregan and Carter, who are freshmen, which was very exciting. Um, just some stats to go over. Um, I had the highest goal percentage per shot. McCall was the fourth goals per game. And this is uh, all the entire state, by the way. Um, we started as a hobby, like I said, and ended up being top eight in the entire state, which is pretty exciting. Um, while we strengthened our skills in the game, we also strengthened friendships overall, like I said, with Bregan and Carter. Um, and I'm very looking forward to having another shot at a state championship in the future. All right, so I am Griffin Berwick. I am the team manager for the league team. So we finished fourth in playoffs, and we got unfortunately got eliminated in top 16 in the Eastern time zone because Michigan doesn't have enough league teams to compete in the state by itself. So the team was me, Cole Dorlag, Bryce Matthews, Kiki Abdur-Rashid, Martin Kina, and Ibrahim Sasiko. He unfortunately sort of dropped out for Rocket League and varsity hockey later, but he was on the team in the beginning. So league is consistently one of the largest games in the world, both on the esports team uh, scene and not. Uh, however, almost no one who plays League of Legends will tell you that they play League of Legends. So this was sort of a great way to find a new way to connect with others, because other than one person, I didn't know anyone on the team because no one talks about it. Uh, so. We set up a Discord server for the team because League requires voice channels because it's five people in a row who can't communicate easily unless they are on a voice channel. So when the team goes larger, we hope to use that to sort of communicate to others, use it to, sort of how teachers use Google Classroom now, except for the players on the team. Uh, so League is also one of the most common forms of scholarship opportunities for colleges. Uh, college has an esports scholarship it will most certainly include league uh and so i got accepted to michigan tech and i am in conversation uh, along with mr v about getting a scholarship there for esports so i am the captain of one of the smash teams uh, our final record was six and three we got 20th in the state it's uh me marco who's right there uh Elias and Mason Combs, who is our sub. Sum it up. Oh, uh, uh, I'm Dylan Chapman. I'm the lead of Team Gearman uh, with me, uh, Jack Mormon, and Ian Gear and uh, Evan Dinglehorn. I don't know that. Uh, uh, Evan Dinkleman. Our final record was uh, four and five, uh, which is uh, pretty average across the board, and we placed 53rd in state. I'm Jackson Cravens. I'm on a team with. Oh. I'm Jackson Cravens. I'm on a team with AJ Barrett, Jaden Walker, and Owen Chatting. Um, our final record was three five, and uh, we placed eighty six in the state. So the nice thing about Smash is that you don't have to be good going in because it's really easy to pick up. So uh, it's very accessible. In fact, some of the young, some of the best like top players in the world at Smash are 17, so it's really nice. Uh, it's a fun opportunity to make friends and just have fun. And uh, even though my team didn't make states, I was able to go to the solo Smash tournament at states, and I was able to place third there. So I got the attention of some of the uh, college recruiters there. So that was nice. And uh, it's just nice to get to know people and have fun through uh, something that you enjoy. All right, I'm, <clears throat> I'm Marco Matthews, and I'm the manager and team captain of Mario Kart, and my team is me, Braden Marion, Elias Armaza, and Nate Yonak, and we ended up making it all the way to um, uh, the in-person um, uh, semifinals at Oakland University, and we won this plaque for a top four finish, getting number three in the state. And um, basically, so what I kind of got out of doing this whole thing was I was able to pursue a hobby of m playing Mario Kart, and I've always been a Mario fan, and it's kind of hard to find other people who are Mario fans nowadays, especially in high school as well. And also, um, it was also good to experience being on a team because I don't really like sports that much. So being able to actually like work with other people in a competitive setting of something that I actually like care about was really special to me. 
And going into it, I kind of assumed that we would just win a lot because I'm a really good player myself, but we ended up losing one of our very first games, and that made me realize that I need to help my team so they can help me. We all need to work together and get better, and that's exactly what we did. After we lost that one game, we just kept on winning and winning all the way through the playoffs until we finally reached um, the semifinals and ended up finishing in the third in the state. So that's pretty much what I got out of it. So just kind of wrap up, we uh, wanted to thank you guys for your support. We really wouldn't have been able to do any of this without you guys, so we genuinely appreciate it. And the idea that a few months ago this was just kind of a concept and, and now it's kind of coming together and becoming a reality is very rewarding um, for me and everybody here and all the people we're representing that uh, couldn't make it. Um, but I just want to thank you guys, and we're very excited for the spring season. Thank you guys so much. Thank you very much. Don't go anywhere yet. Thank you. Uh, we may have a few co comments and questions, and I know Superintendent Lodge has a few things, well, at least one thing to say. Yeah, I just wanted to thank all of you for coming to present tonight. I really do love the concept of um, many people who didn't know each other very well coming together to create these teams is that spirit of competition, collaboration, all those things that we talk about being important life skills uh, later on are, are, are coming to play with, with eSports. I also want to thank um, community, uh, director, community Education Director Brian Puffer actually sort of started this going as a, a club and then now it's made its way to the high school and Mr. Vasiloff, although n not here tonight, has been keeping us updated all the time throughout the district on how the team is doing and his enthusiasm for this is is unwavering so we're really grateful that this has started too as well and we we appreciate all of you yeah of course any comments uh from the table yeah i just want to say you know it's it's great to see that people did come together and you know made this happen i also liked hearing some of the comments about you know not everybody does play sports so you know this does give an, a, a connection for our team experience for people and so that was really really a nice comment too yeah, I, I really like that piece, and uh, I guess I got a couple of things. Number one, I love seeing in the pictures about how we're utilizing our technologies, how we're utilizing our classrooms and our resources. And so when you think about ways in which, like when we pass a bond, right, when those things, we think of, you know, our robotics team comes to see us, our Science Olympiad, now eSports, you will benefit from these things. So I'm really excited about the technological things that we're providing for, for young people. So that makes me really happy. Um, I have two, well, I have three questions. One is really funny, I, I think. Um, I see on the back of your shirts like aqua, music tabs. Uh, those are gamer tags. Those are gamer tags, yeah. all right. So I'm, I'm obviously very with it. Yeah, yeah, all right, that's your gamer tag, all right. Usually you'd have like most jerseys and sports uniforms. You'd see a number on the back, which is just like the player number. Yeah, I love that. All right, how are your games chosen? You know, like, so are, is there a list of all the possible games that you can be involved with, or is there a, a set six that this is statewide what is offered? It depends per game. For me, for Rocket League, it would just kind of, um, you would choose kind of which rank you would play against based on whichever rank you were. And then when you started up the season, you would start playing players in other teams that were like fim uh, similar ranks. And then Based on if you won or lost, you would face teams like similar in skill level based on your wins and losses. And it kind of took everything into account, like ranking and wins, um, to eventually see who would be the top of the state. Uh, so we run through a platform called PlayVS, and they have a set list of games that they have approved that they run the competitions for. Right. So we chose four of those right now. We're probably going to add more later. So we just chose those four. We're competing in those four. We can add more later. But yeah, people just go to whatever they want to. You can. All right, that's awesome. I mean, I, I will tell you that I love Mario Kart, but now, oh. And you can um, you can do multiple games at once if you want, because they happen on different days. So okay. the only two that you can't do at the same time are Rocket League and Mario Kart, because they run on the same day. Oh. But like Marco's doing uh, Mario Kart and Smash, so you can you can do multiple. So this there's different possibilities, and you do this every day of the week. Yeah. Wow. That's cool, guys. All right, well, I was about to say that banana peels have always been my nemesis on uh, Mario Kart. Well, not every day. Monday and Friday are both the uh, our, uh, D and D days, so you can't do it those days because they're reviews. So it's yeah. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. All right. 
And then the last question I tend to ask to a lot of groups is, how can we further support you? Like, how can the board further support this team? Um, that's honestly a hard question because I feel like we're getting a lot of support anyway. Um, but, I mean, I don't know. Do you guys have anything? More advertising. That's More, it. Advertising. <laughs> More advertising, yeah. There we go. Uh, they don't shut it down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. Um, her name's Jackie. She's right over there, so she can help you. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, Nick, I really appreciated you talking about making freshman friends. Um, I have two freshmen, and the thing that we've liked as a family um, the most is how the senior and upper upperclassmen have really been considerate of the freshmen. Um, I hope it happens every year. I can tell you it happened this year for sure quite a bit, so I love you amplifying that. It's so great for you and the others to model that inclusiveness for other kids that um, are just getting to know your school. So I love that. Um, so keep going and, and all of you, uh, I appreciate you coming to the podium and introducing yourselves and showing real innovation, I think, um, and creativity in the club. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I will admit to you that I am not much of a gamer, so I do like Mario Kart, but I'm sure I could not compete against any of you. Um, it usually involves me like screaming as I like careen off the road or something. But um, anyway, uh, I was wondering if you could just give us a picture of like what a competition day looks like. Like, do you all come to our school and then remotely connect with other teams, or do you meet at a location with lots of other teams? What does that look like for esports? So typically, it'll be held in Mr. Vassal's room in the high school, and then through play versus, as Griffin mentioned, you'll kind of just compete against the team virtually. And inside the game, there's like invite systems, so then you can just invite and play the teams just on the game, so. Okay, that's what I wonder, but you yeah. went to Oakland, right? Yeah, I was Okay, so that was a little bit of a different yeah, situation. Yeah, it, it was a bit different. We had to, um, uh, basically, we, we were going there to take, take on the teams in person, and they kind of have a whole little setup there of just like a bunch of computers in this like little area. So we had to like bring all of our own equipment all the way to there. And it was like an hour drive. And then, um, and then we pretty much just like set it all up. We didn't, we didn't have that much time to practice. We kind of just like go straight into it. And we, and um, uh, the final, like um, uh, normally it's just like a best of three there. But if you got to the finals, then you would end up having to do a best of five. And you also had an opportunity to, uh, go up against like if you got um uh, if you got like um if you lost your semifinals game you could go against the other loser and fight for third place. So we didn't get to do that, but the other team just left so we just took third place. <laughs> but yeah, it's a lot more fun though to play just in person, be able to see the other players and be able to like, you know, shake their hand, kind of have that more sportsmanship aspect to it cuz you don't really get to communicate with them as much when you're just playing with them like on the other side of a screen. So I think it is a good experience to be able to get up to that level and go play in person with other people. Well, hopefully this spring, right? This spring, that would be awesome if more of you could get to do that too. Well, congratulations on a great season, and uh, we'll, I hope that we get to hear from you again in the spring. Yeah, thank you very much, Marco coming. and team. If they bring back, uh, oh, do you want something? Oh, no, I just want to. Oh, of course, of course, Matteo. I just want to say congrats on the season, and congrats, Griffin, on getting into Michigan Tech and yeah. hopefully getting the chance to be on the esports team there and you know take them to maybe a national championship. I just, a quick question, because I know sports, there tend to be a little trash talk and stuff. So in esports, are you connected to the other team through the mic? Are you able to trash talk them to maybe to get in their heads a little and uh, win, a, win? For Rocket League, you can't connect through the mic. And one team did do trash talk at some point, and they got disciplined. So, But I mean, I don't know about for League of Legends, Mario Kart, or Super Smash, if there's any trash talk. but. That's all I know. And Sma uh, Smash Bros. is a fighting game, and in most fighting games, there are more indirect ways to trash talk. <laughs> yeah, there's no voice chat in Mario Kart, but if there was, it'd probably be a lot of screaming, I assume. So maybe it's a good thing there isn't. Hey, Johnny, I would love to hear you. Well, if they bring back Castle Wolfenstein or Doom, I'm there. Okay. <laughs> Have I just dated myself? Like yeah, totally yeah. Oh, no, no, you're thinking of Quake. Uh, I, I didn't get as far as Quake, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you very much, gentlemen and uh, team, and it's great, great to have you here. And yeah, as, a, as Secretary Miller said, hope to see you in the spring. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you.
we have a few action items this evening. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the November year. Oh. Oh, well, wait a second. I may have the uh, thing out of order. Yeah, no. Um, give me one moment, please. Uh, no, I've got, I've got a fresh one down here. Thank you. We'll, we'll do the uh, report in just a bit. So uh, you're on, Secretary Miller. I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the, uh, from the November 14th closed session for the purpose of collective bargaining, 8C of the Open Meetings Act. Oh, it's okay. So move, Stebbin. Stebbin. Support. Support. E step. Thank you. Support. No, Ross. E step supports. Those of you who are new to this, we uh, during the closed session, we just quietly read the minutes and check to make sure that everything is as we recall it, and uh, we'll vote on it in just a moment. Looks like they're all back. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, seven zero, thank you. Oh, uh, six zero. Oh. oh, who abstained? Okay, well you could trust us. Thank you, six zero. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the allocation of funds for the round one 23-24 CARES grant in the amount of $37,460.22 as submitted by Brian Puffer, Director of Community Education. I'll make the motion. Brad Kirby. Tim Austin, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for, or anything you'd like to add, sir? All right. Uh, first, I just want to say, um, for remember in the spring, we passed a CARES grant for the eSports team startup, so it's kind of cool to see it in action when they're here for the program. So again, thanks for proving that in the springtime. So kind of need to see that in person. Uh, as you can see, we had five grants submitted for a total of $42,460.22. The CARES board approved uh, four of those for $37,460. Uh, excuse me, $37,460.22. Uh, the one grant that was denied was from, uh, called TAG. Uh, that grant was denied because the CARES Board um, said it did not serve the Sling community directly. Um, round two applications are now being accepted with our deadline of January 6, 2024. Uh, and then our CARES Board will meet again in February and March to decide on round two. Any questions for Mr. Puffer? I have one. Okay. Um, hi, hey. who's on the CARES board right now? So we have uh, three new CARES board members. So we have the returning are Jim Haft and Chris Michelak, and then Megan Hughes, Greg Holmberger, and Gwen Fredrickson round out the board. Thank you. Yeah. Super, well hearing no other comments, we'll just put this to a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, now I can say 7-0. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Puffer. Mr. Puffer, thank you. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the recommendation of Clark Construction to award contracts for the Saline Area Schools Playground and the Harvest Up parking lot improvements in the total of four million eight hundred and thirty nine thousand three hundred and twenty eight, as submitted by Rex Clary, Director of Operations. Is that Tim Austin? Uh, do you support and supported by Brad Gerby? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Clary, any, uh, you just apparated. <laughs> um, so this is a combination. This is the Harvest Parking Lot will be our last project, pretty much our last project from phase three of the Safe Warm and Dry um, bond proposal we passed in 2015. Um, and then the playgrounds improvements um, will be done this summer um, with the one of the first projects we said uh, for the new bond, the bond 2022 pro, uh, program. Um, budgets came, the numbers came in at budget. 
Um, good bid coverage. We were lacking one bid coverage in Earthwork, um, but we did come in at budget and uh, asking you for approval on this construction that will start this summer. Thank you very much. Any comments? We do like it when things come in on budget. So, right then. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you very much. 7 0. Um, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the roofing and solar project budget of $15,400,770, including contracts to Amoresco for $5,694,483, quality roofing for $2,342,161, roofing technology associates at $532,363, and Lecole planners for $327,392, per the recommendation by Rex Clary, Director of Operations. Were you waiting for me to trip over any of those numbers? Not a single one, okay. Motion, Gerby. Gerby. Support motion. Jay Miller, thank you very much. Any other comments you wanna make, sir? This is just a continuation of the proposal, or the um, uh, presentation we gave in, at the November board meeting. Um, we are still on schedule. Uh, we received our roofing bid. Um, roofing bid came in at an excellent price. Um, so, uh, we're still on schedule to get this homeland provision in to get submitted by December 31st so we can ensure that we're going to get the biggest rebate uh, po po possible for the roofing and solar co integrated roofing system. So. Oh, and I have also, tonight I have uh, Mark from Locoli Planners uh, with me as well. Thank you. Oh, um, I did reach out to uh, John Paul II uh, uh, school, uh, high school in uh, London, Ontario, and we've set up a visit, but uh, I haven't been able to get up there during a week yet, but it's gonna happen before, be in, before the end to see their solar, their net zero school, and look for some ideas for us. They, they're gonna put me in contact with somebody up there. Uh, we have two comments from the board. Um, I would just add, um, in addition to the figures that President McVeigh mentioned, we would uh, include the 1.6 and change TBD, the 3.4 million TBD, and I just wanted to verify it's 1.4, so 1, comma 0.70. It's missing on the um, on the bid under contingency, so I just want to verify that 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 amount, which rolls up to the 15.4 um, and change. Just for the record, since it's all a lot of money. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. The, so the TBD will be bid, will be competitively bid. The solar installation panel, the installation of the panels, as well as the roof for the high school, will be competitively bid in the future. This spring for the panels, and then next next fall for the roof, roof at the high school. Um, so the rebates, is that something that, I mean, I don't know if it'll come to the board, whether you all um, have secured that or not, or maybe it's a, just an email, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so with every project like this, there are risks. Um, we're trying to do everything we can to, make, to minimize that risk, working with um, True and our lawyers through with Amoresco, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, after our meeting with Troon, it was, you guys are on the cutting edge because a lot of schools aren't doing this yet because it's brand new. Um, but with this Homeland Security, the provision where we're getting it submitted by the 31st, paying a minimum of 5%, um, initiating that before the 31st for materials, and actually we're gonna go to 7%, making it a solar integrated roofing project. We're trying to do everything we can to, to make sure that we get the most pr of that rebate. But with everything, there are risks. That money will all go back into the bond program. It will not hit the general fund. It will go right back into the bond program. And we hope to make a big announcement when that happens. Um. All right. Awesome. Thank you for um, pursuing, I mean, this, this project um, and um, also pursuing um, the funding that's out there. I think that's so important. So thanks. Absolutely, Mr. Awesome. I had... I talked to Rex earlier because I had some questions on this, on the ROI and so forth. And in, in one thing that was interesting to me was you had mentioned if we were just to not do the solar roofing, we were just going to replace these roofs. We'd be upwards of close to 15, 000, 15 million anyways to, to replace these. So 
by doing this and if we can get the rebates, we, we're actually going to save quite a bit of money. Correct, yes. Doing, taking care of the roofs now with a membrane uh, rather than waiting 10 years and doing a full takeoff with insulation and replacing the entire roof. This gives us doing it now and getting the rebate with the solar um, gives us a 25-year warranty on the solar panels, a 25-year warranty on the roof. Uh, it puts us in great shape. Plus, it allows for, again, that 200000 plus dollars per year savings to the general fund as well. Well, I greatly appreciate how carefully you take care of our pennies and dollars, I think, and the taxpayers' dollars. Thank you so much, both of you, Mark and Rex. Thank you. Oh, did we vote on this? Let's do that, shall we? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 7-0. Thank you very much, sirs. Thank you. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the 20, uh, 19, sorry, 1924. <laughs> 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 the 24-25 new courses to the Celine High School course catalog as submitted by Executive Director of Teaching and Learning, Kara Davis. And I'll let you read them off for us and talk about them. Thank you. Uh, sure, we have unified physical education. I actually don't have the descriptions in front of us, but this um, physical education class is intended to meet the needs of a group of students who have um, other health and fitness goals beyond the athletic space. We just heard about how important that was from our eSports team. Um, in partnership with some of our students who might associate with a connecting club or want to do some more mentorship um, in a space that feels safe and inclusive and has the right equipment for students of all mobility needs. So that's unified physical education. Intro to cybersecurity is just that. It would be an introductory cybersecurity class open to 9th through 12th graders um, in order to get uh, we don't have this right now at the Selene's, at Selene schools. Uh, we do have it through SWOC if you get into the program and are able to take it out of Chelsea. Um, so this would be an introductory class as a feeder. And then community leadership and housing and interior design previously used to be in our course packet, um, and we had removed them. So we are looking forward to bringing them back. The community leadership um, was one of our feeder classes for our um, student council and helping with internal leadership skills um, that would benefit the community. We do have some classes that, of course, do community-based work and volunteering out in the community at large and, it, and not just nationally and internationally. This one would be mostly focused on our actual school district itself. And then housing interior design um, also had previously been in the course book and bringing this back, uh, this is a space that I noticed last year was missing when we were working with our um, design team and um, we're looking for partnerships and students who might want to intern in this area and we don't actually have a direct interior design class that combines the art and the math and the engineering plus the um, empathy interviews to design well um, in terms of structures even though we do have some of the design work in CAD uh, the actual thoughtfulness behind it and in the interior design will come out in this class so these are the four on the docket for this year Thank you. I was so uh, turned around by being in the wrong century that I forgot to ask for uh, a motion. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> and now I'm asking. I, I would happily do that. <laughs> uh, motion. Uh, Stebbin. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, support L. Gold. Thank you very much. If you've done with your presentation, we'll dive right into uh, quick questions. Okay. If you have any. We have a question. <clears throat> we have many questions. Chip Dale. I'm very excited about our unified. Oh, are you? I on? think your microphone. I'm very. No, what number is it? Ben. Sorry, he's working on it. Can you hear me? Yes. yes right. Thanks. <coughs> I'm really excited about unified physical education. I wondered. Um, do you envision it being taught by our current phys ed teachers? Is this going to be a special ed component? How? Yes, um, actually, it's in partnership. So Joe Welton and Nikki Hotop have met with uh, Trish Fair, Kim Munn, and Kevin Musson to talk about the needs in the different uh, groups of students that we have at the high school and where we can improve our physical education opportunities for these students um, in, in partnership with students who may or may not necessarily be in the special education programming but want another safe, inclusive space for, um, for physical education and health and well-being. So we're looking to really promote that, um, not necessarily through that athletic strength and conditioning lens. Do we have a Special Olympics presence at the schools at all? We do, so, um, yeah. yes. Yeah. Even though it's you know not not looking athletics, okay, great, very excited. These yeah. look like really great classes. 
Thank you. And thank you to Mrs. Steger who helped lead the um, conversations around this at the high school alongside of her teaching and learning, or her teacher leader team. Um, fabulous courses. So totally echo what, what Lauren just said. Um, really like hearing that you're using empathy interviews in the fourth uh, one, housing and interior design. I love that because that's something that you can apply in many different disciplines. Mm -hmm. So well done. Um, cybersecurity and community leadership, excellent. Um, there are a lot of people in our community that would volunteer to be um, uh, their clubs, their organizations, as you know, um, and cybersecurity, I, I think I know a really good mm -hmm. guest speaker for you. So if this is approved, um, leveraging some of the um, subject matter experts in our community could be idea. really good for a couple of these. Great. That's a great idea. Thank you. I think with unless there are nothing more from the group. All right. Thank you. I'd like to put this to a vote then. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Well, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to seeing these courses in the book. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Sit right over there. You're not going too far, are you? No. <laughs> we have... <laughs> We have one scheduled report this evening from uh, Kara Davis, Jen Nelson, Beth Russo, and Caroline Stout. Yes. Thank you so much for introducing uh, the members of our teaching and learning team or who are going to help us with our teaching and learning team report today. Um, just as a reminder to frame this report, uh, we do a fall, when we come back to school in August, we do a presentation where we provide the information from the spring test results alongside of our updated MyKIP goals and our plans for the school year in terms of addressing the areas of need that we have identified and lifting up the strengths that we have achieved as well across the course of the previous year. This report is really looking at our results from our fall testing, and I know Caroline will go into this. So it's really reflecting um, any summer slide and any of the, the pieces that we want to notice and then have um, as our baseline data to start the school year. So while we are giving it in December, it's actually a reflective of our fall data. Um, and then we will come back to a, um, additional updates to actually hear that result um, next September as well. So just to remind you of how the sequence goes, not to say that this is our last teaching and learning report for the year because we are doing one on special populations and then on our EL students. Um, but I just wanted to give, remind you of how the frame of our reporting goes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Caroline for our update. I think one of the things, hi, thank you for having us tonight. One of the things that Karen and I were reflecting on earlier is the fact that the timing is kind of difficult to um, get right on this. So I think in the future we might shift to having one in the fall that kind of reviews all of last year's stuff and the plan for this year and then maybe one in April instead so that we can give you the update on how the plan that we had set up worked, what we tweaked, and then we would have fall and winter data to share. Um, because this one, just like I said, is really just an update on the scores. Nothing has changed drastically about the plan that we proposed in the fall, which is good because things are on track. So um, so I always leave these couple of slides because I know you have access to this and I think they're just good references, um, but I've talked about them in the past. So I'm going to skip ahead. One new thing is I mentioned um, uh, last update that Acadians is changing platform. So new website, different look. And so the report that I used to pull from there that has these bars um, actually no longer exists in the new um, website. It, there's a lot of really good updates, but this is definitely something we missed. So since I had to create it from scratch anyway, I went ahead and made it a rainbow because I thought that was prettier. Um, but I also, thank you, I also um, added two more years. So it used to be you could only see eight years at a time. I added an extra two. I could do all 15. I have some that have all, but then it gets like kind of crowded. But at least here we have a pretty good visual of like pre-pandemic, a good number of years, and then post-pandemic, so you can observe the trend hopefully a little better. So it was not my intent, but I accidentally made the year that the pandemic data starts red. Um, <laughs> but just so you know, from now on, all the graphs will stay the same color. So same color for the same year, all right? So let's get into it. This is just data. Um, so Acadians Kindergarten, again, now we have 10 years of data. Um, I presented earlier this fall on last year, which is the orange one there. Um, and now the yellow, the last one, if you look at beginning of the year, is our percent benchmark for kindergarten reading. Um, there, as I go through these, 
there are some trends that I can explain. There are others that I, I can't. And the next one is kind of a big one that I'm still working on explaining. We're still working on explaining. So, so real quick, you can see here, um, students are coming in slightly higher in terms of percent of benchmark in kindergarten reading. Where they left um, was a, a significant improvement for where we started in the fall. Um, but then something a little bit strange happened over the summer. We had a bigger, I don't want to say summer slide because I think that's misleading, but there was a bigger drop between the spring and the fall than there usually is. So our first graders um, came in at uh, a percentage benchmark that is below where it, it typically is by quite a bit. Um, this is probably the biggest like blip in our data that we've been mulling over. One of the things that I can say is that um, when you look at this, our sub so this is the composite, right? We've talked about this before. This is like the overall kind of health equivalent score, right? When you look at the detail, the subtest scores, um, the subtest scores are actually not that different than they have been in a couple years. So we have about the same percent of benchmark when you look at sub skills of thorniumic awareness or basic phonics or letter naming fluency. One of the things that's unusual about this fall's data is that it seems to be a different group of students who's not at benchmark on each subtest, which can kind of explain this somewhat. So that could just be that it's a, a strangely diverse group in terms of their skills. I don't have all the answers for that one, but I just kind of wanted to point that out. Um, then when we look at second grade, fall data is coming in higher than the last three years, which is great. So this, we're still in reading. Um, third grade is looking really good. Also, again, we're always looking at that benchmark of we want at least 80% of students coming in at that level. We know we're going to meet the needs of all of them as well as we can, but if we have at least 80% who don't need any extra intervention, that is sustainable. Um, and then we always do a look at these scores by subcategory. Um, another thing that we're exploring, trying to figure out how to do logistically is how to do this instead of a snapshot of time, like this is fall data from this, um, from this year, trying to do this where we follow students over the years in these subgroups. Um, because for example, to point to one category, our students with IEPs or the same I think would apply to students who are EL, who are multilingual, um, students with IEPs, one of the qualification criteria is that you have to show an academic impact. So we're not necessarily going to see that graph be all green tomorrow. However, if we track those students over time, we should be able to see better progress than this slice or snapshot. Um, so now, again, I promised you the same colors, so we're sticking with the same colors, even though in WA we don't have as many years of data to report on. So this is fourth grade. Um, the percent of students not at benchmark, because that doesn't exist in NWA, but this is the percent of students that are at least average on NWA. So again, we're very fortunate. We have a really high number of students who are scoring at that average or above average level in fourth grade. Um, and then the next slides, you'll see a, another kind of funky trend, um, which is sometimes students left us in the spring and the percent who were above average was higher than the fall, and sometimes it was opposite. So in this case, um, the, the fifth grade um, percent at benchmark this fall is a little bit lower, but sorry, if you go back um, for fourth grade, that's a bit, that's fairly equivalent. But now we look at um, the sixth grade is coming in about the same if you look at where the sixth graders ended, and now you look at seventh grade, they came in higher even though they didn't necessarily end higher. I don't know if that makes any sense. Even though they didn't necessarily end higher than the year before. So like if you see... They ended somewhat higher. Sorry, I know I'm clicking back and forth. And then eighth grade, they came in about the same. So again, there's NWA has always been a little bit trickier to interpret because it's not correlated with um, other measures in the way that dip, uh, Acadians is. Um, but we're still pretty pleased with how this is looking for reading. Um, we're going to do, ooh, sorry. This is our disproportionality uh, graph as well. And then we'll give you kind of a quick update of what's happened with literacy, and then I'll come back and I'll show the math. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to update quickly on secondary. Um, so right now we continue to, to collect data to drive our instructional shifts and examine excess points for where we can bring in some more interventions and supports like we have at the elementary level. So what does that mean for 23-24? What we're doing right now is, so we have all this SAT data, we have PSAT data, we have NWA data that we can look back on, but none of that, that gives us really specific information like those core literacy skills. So like how many of our students in ninth grade, for example, can decode multisyllabic words 
with proficiency. And if we have that number, can we look at like the students who are struggling in that and make some predictions on say when they go into content area classes. So if they're gonna go into biology, they're gonna go into world history and they're gonna have textbooks. Well, I guess they probably don't have that many, but they're gonna go on and read the same information that we used to get in textbooks. Um, can they decode those words and where does that, imp look, you know, how does that reflect on their grades? So for 23, 24, we're looking at kind of drilling down that data into those specific core literacy skills and getting some information, figuring out which student groups we can look at to get that data, um, what we could do for it, both in the, the short term and the long term, and then look for access points to bring in intervention supports for 24-25. Hey everyone. So like Caroline and Kara said, we presented this in the fall. And so these things we shared in the fall are still in progress. So we just kind of changed the verbs here to show like it's not just uh, an idea, like they are up and running. So I wanted to highlight something that we didn't talk about in the fall because you can read all of these and I already talked about them in October. But one of the things that Caroline and I have been talking about for a long time is how to bring families into the literacy work that we're doing in, in school so that they can partner with us at home. So they feel informed, but then also things we're doing in school, they can use the same strategies at home so that we're creating some consistency. Um, that always felt like we're not really ready for it. We're really working with teachers right now. And so this fall, we were like, let's just do it. Let's just give Jackie a date and put it on the calendar. And so we did, and that then forced us to have a presentation, which we did last Tuesday in this room. And we had about 15 parents come, and we walked them through the elements that are essential for early literacy. They had an opportunity to practice some things. Um, we provided a lot of resources um, that they could use at home, and then had some really great question and answer, um, a question and answer portion to kind of address their immediate needs. And Caroline are already talking about how to improve that in the future and build off of that going forward. So linked here is our presentation. It's also shared in Steve's uh, weekly email if people want to access it that weren't able to make it to the, the session. So quick look at some of the math data. Again, same colors. So this is starting in 2020, 2021. So kindergarten in the fall is just kind of interesting to see how consistent those scores are, which they're pretty darn consistent here. Um, first grade, um, things are looking fairly steady. Um, second grade, we saw a pretty big increase, which is really great. So 83% at benchmark. That's the first time we've hit 80% in this measure, which is great. Um, and then third grade, we saw a little increase since last year as well. Um, again, we're looking at a different way of, of measuring this over time, but we do continue to see disproportionality in some of our um, subpopulations. Um, NWA, this is where it starts to get kind of funky between like the spring scores and the next fall scores. So this fall trend um, looks like a, a downward step, which we don't like to see. However, if you look at the end score, 79% at benchmark, but now there is that dip, even though, okay, I'm going to go back and forth again. So those scores were not that significant in the spring, but now we saw that pretty significant um, drop. And then if you go to um, fifth grade, end of fifth grade, we were 80, 80% um, of benchmark in the spring. And now again, 73%. So I, I don't have an explanation for that drop. I wish I did. I'm still looking for one. Um, but then we look at seventh grade and things are in the opposite direction in the, in the fall. Um, same with eighth grade. And then that is the graph where I pulled out all the subpopulations. So now here are a couple updates of what's been happening with math. So again, these things were shared in the fall. So the thing that I want to highlight that I mentioned a little bit in the fall is that we're currently in a math curriculum review where we work with teachers to review our curriculum, determine um, if what resources we have for teachers are is working for students, provide professional learning, and part of that this year is that we've partnered with Dr. Sarah Powell. She's a professor at the University of Texas. And we have been meeting with her on Zoom with the teacher leaders leading the math curriculum review. And we've had a lot of positive feedback from teachers trying new things in their classroom. We met just um, last week and we have another one tomorrow 
um, really focus on, focusing on math vocabulary. And so in this case, we have some direct instruction and learning from Sarah, and then teachers get to apply, try some new things, and then share that, make plans to share that with their greater grade level at another time. So that's been a really positive um, experience this year. From the secondary lines, again, it's, it's very similar to literacy where we're looking to drill down our data. We, ha we I would say we're a few steps ahead in math than we are in literacy. Our data is a little more specific when it comes to us from the PSAT and SAT. Um, but on top of that, so we are looking at screening some students. We have, it's, it's a little bit easier to identify those students at the secondary level. We have a few more access points, we believe, at the secondary level in terms of offering additional support and intervention. So we, we're hoping to move forward on that pretty, pretty soon. Um, on top of that, uh, at the high school in particular, there's a group of us, it's admin, a couple teachers, and myself. Uh, we get together for data retreats. Uh, we've done a couple already this year, and we're really drilling down. We go to the ISD, and they have these beautiful charts and graphs that we can look at, and we can really take the scores and break them down into subgroups. We can compare them across years. We can look at specific skills, and we can start making some hypotheses and like, what, here's, here's a trend we're seeing. What could this be? What else can we do to, to address it? So some of it's as simple as like, Throwback Thursday, some of the math teachers at the high school are doing Throwback Thursdays where they're going back through something maybe the students haven't seen since seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade algebra, and they're showing it to them every Thursday so that some of these skills are coming back around. Um, so math we're pretty excited about. We started building that toolbox. We have some um, evidence-based interventions that we're exploring um, specifically. But once we get, again, that drilled down data of where do our students need the most support, we'll look for the right intervention and put our resources there. Um, again, so last, in, in April, we presented, um, so at the secondary level, when it comes to MTSS, it's not just the reading data and the math data, it's also looking at um, EWIMS, or Early Warning Intervention and Monitoring System. Um, so that's, again, it's, it's just to remind you, it's, uh, do I put it on here? It's attendance, behavior, and course performance data, so it's the ABCs. Um, last year we talked about, we really were looking at, we, we gathered, couple years in, in back of the data so that we could look at trends across years. We continue to gather that data through last year and through the first trimester of this year. And we're now kind of into that step five where we're assigning and providing interventions. So uh, you do have some historical attendance uh, student engagement data for the two years. And you can see this is 21-22 and 22-23, so last year. And then you have great, uh, course performance data, which is 21, 22, and 22, 23. So some of the work around this, and we kind of just in general call it our, our engagement data, and, and students coming in, we want them to feel like they belong and they have a place and they have support. Um, so some of the work we're doing around that is uh, partnering with our deans in terms of attendance communication, making sure we're having positive communication, recognizing that we are a team, we want to work together, work with families. If something's going on, let us know so we can support you. Um, so we have regular communication about attendance. Um, and then it, just in the last month or so, we are drafting some mentoring protocols that we will use in both buildings. Um, one that will be kind of like a daily check-in, and then one that would be a weekly check-in. So uh, running those by the building admins uh, in the next couple weeks to bring in some specific mentoring programs. Thank you, team. And those we have four now yes all right thanks we'll open it for uh, questions happy to write things down and or answer thank you mm -hmm. um i was just looking at the academic indicators in the secondary mtss and last year i remember we could easily see the uh, the the d's and e's and uh, this particular year i don't see them so I suppose that's a good sign. I'll open the table, the floor, to other people on the board. Questions? Queries? Oh, Lauren. Do we have fewer years of math in the past than we did of reading for some reason? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have, we have fewer years of reading for a couple of things for a couple of years. We have fewer years of NWA because NWA does not let you go back and see this. Um, and so we only have when I started collecting this data, when I started like pulling it and saving it, I didn't realize that you couldn't go back that far in their system. 
and I've taken it to all levels of NWA, and they still don't release it. Um, but uh, for Acadians, we didn't start really using Acadians um, K3 until we switched from NWA K3 to that um, as our state assessment, basically. Um, before then, we did try out Acadian. Um, we did prior to that um, pilot Acadians when it, Acadians math when it was in research um, phase at Pleasant Ridge for a number of years. We do have some data back then, but their official norms um, were kind of revised as part of that. So what we present here is only district-wide data, and it's the first year that we started using it was 2020-2021. So it looked like generally we were kind of in the low 70s for math, but more in the like is there a def different goal benchmark? Because I think you said 80% for literacy. That's such a great question. No, it's the same goal. So what happened when we switched to Acadians, one of the reasons that we sought it out in the first place, Acadians math that is, is because we really didn't have a measure to look at foundational math skills very directly. Um, and we really weren't um, re really even having the kind of conversations we are now about the building blocks of numeracy including things like subitizing and cardinality and, um, and some of those skills that, to be honest, can't really be measured on a computer at that age. Um, so I think in a lot of districts, actually, this is a really hot topic in the dyslexia legislation conversation right now of like the fact that NWA is kind of, um, in some ways, masking um, some issues that are underlying in both literacy and math. So when we were using NWA, our, our scores actually looked pretty good with math, but we had a bunch of teachers who were saying things like, I see you nodding, <laughs> who were saying things like, our students don't know their math facts, which was, as it turns out, a symptom of a, of a bigger issue with some foundational skills. Not that our students couldn't do it, but that our students needed to have uh, extra practice in order for those sub-skills to be really automatic so that they didn't hold them back from gaining higher level math competencies, if that makes any sense. So, you know, the whole reason that we care about math facts is not so that we can race and, you know, have, have fun figuring out who's fastest. It's so that when you're doing more complex math problems, you're not going like this to figure out, you know, 12 plus 15 or something like that. So um, we sought out Acadians because we suspected that there was a deficit there globally that we didn't have any data on. And sure enough, we did. And as you can see over the years, we've tried to rectify that trend, um, but it's the same benchmark. So 80% is still what we're looking for. Um, what I'll say is when we look at the subtests in this composite, we have a pretty big um, divide between our um, scores that are of subtests that measure concepts and applications or word problems or measurement versus those that measure those more foundational number sense type skills. It's the number sense ones that our students do well, but they're just not quite automatic enough to pass benchmark on this. And that's kind of what's dragging the whole thing down. So we're working on it. That's part of the partnership with Sarah Powell. Um, it, the Curriculum Review um, Committee has been really intently looking at that. And we've done a number of professional development um, pieces uh, related to that. That was my qu other question, like what year we started everyday math or like how long has this, that's been predates the low 70s, yes. which we don't really have a comparison for in terms of this curriculum and its efficacy. Is that, would that be That's That's accurate? correct. I think one of the things that we're exploring. Yeah, oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so we had reached out as a team uh, last spring to Sarah Powell, who'd worked with our district in the past, to discuss our data and have her look at it directly because we were considering a change or a shift away from everyday math. Um, and Sarah actually recommended that we stay the course because everyday math's um, strengths are in some of those more complex skills that are much harder for teachers to supplement, where some of the skills that um, Caroline is referencing are more easy to supplement. So we're working with um, 
Sarah Powell now to talk about those kinds of things that we need to bring out more. We also recognize that some of the components of everyday math throughout the pandemic and then being hybrid and then bringing students back on board, teachers were dropping some of those components like playing games, using the manipulatives, more time for uh, math talk um, in order to get through that curriculum and we're actually talking about what developmentally makes uh, the most sense of the best practice in a math space for our students to develop those skills. And then simultaneously, through the curriculum review, our secondary math teachers are aware and are looking at what they can do as developmentally appropriate in sixth through 12th grade to help with students who might not have those foundational math skills. And so they've been doing some strategic conversations in that particular space because we recognize we have to close that uh, while we are catching up with the foundational skills that, that our teachers are working so hard on now with our students who are in K-3 and K-5. This is kudos. This is just a great level of analysis, and I'm really pleased to see it. And um, yeah, it's not easy teaching math. It looks like there's some talk of having a math lab in the way that the kids have writing lab now Yes, on this one slide. Yeah, we are exploring that as an option. Um, it's something in terms of, it's a, from a scheduling standpoint, certification standpoint, um, we are really considering what we can do during the school day at the secondary level to support students, um, while also balancing whole student health, not removing one of their electives or derailing their graduation requirements, but in order to really build those foundational skills. And so Beth has done a great job with the high school and middle school teams of looking at even like bio sequencing or the science sequencing as well as math sequencing in order to support students and then what additional classes we might need to add in or opportunities that we might need to add in and what those could look like. Yeah. You're welcome. Just to quickly follow up, the comment about secondary um, math would fully support looking at math lab. Um, I really liked the comment about flashback algebra. Um, it made me a little scared, but uh, it, it's so important because depending on when the kids are taking algebra one, mm -hmm. it can be a while till they get to the SAT. So, um, and, and I know Steve, that's something that you brought up and we've talked about, so I appreciate that. Um, the other comment I had was I really like the partnership with the families on December 5th, the graphic that you showed. So thank you for trying something new and, and diving in. Um, and I know, Kara, this morning at the foundation meeting, you also talked about early childhood um, being a focus for you. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, but um, appreciate that while talking about the first grade and the 59% that you brought up, to, to quote you, there are a lot of bright spots here as well. Um, so thank you for both that secondary math focus specifically and also thinking about our, our littlest learners and the can, um, upcoming additional focus, I think, on early childhood. Yes, and to expand on that for the rest of the board and the audience members, we do have a team studying our early childhood programming here. So we're looking at birth to uh, specifically five and then on to eight. Um, and considering what can Selene Area Schools be doing in that particular age range to continue to uh, provide the best learning environment for our students, the supports at the family level, the youngest age levels, on through preschool and then into young fives, kindergarten and first grade especially, to really get our um, Selene students and our Selene community off to a great start. Um, and so that team is in its infancy. We just had our second meeting, uh, third meeting this past week. Um, and we're looking at where are their opportunities as well as where are their strengths for us to build upon because we've got fabulous teachers and we recognize there's still, this is still an area that we could, um, you know, continue to grow as a district and, and get kids off to the right start. Secretary Miller. Um, so first, I know that you're you're all saying like, oh, like we already talked about this, but it is always really nice to kind of just hear it again. And I think every time I hear it, I have a new or different understanding. So um, while it might seem redundant for you, because I know you're <laughs> you um, went through the slides again and we're like, oh, it's the same thing. Um, but it is it is really helpful for us. I do see the um, desire to maybe have a more um, what you might feel like is a more complete or fulfilled vision to present. And so I would also be in support of that, but I don't want you to think that tonight is <laughs> for nothing because I appreciate it a lot. Um, in thinking about math and, and what was just happening at the table, 
I know that there has been a lot of work from the early math uh, task force, and so I'm wondering, um, do we have people from our district participating in some of the work that's happening at the state level with the math essentials and some of the training that's coming from um, that, uh, that resource? As the early literacy coach in the district, I go to some of the things offered for the math. Um, the math offers not quite as much as they're offering at the state level for literacy right now, sort of up and coming. Mm -hmm. So we're really watching some of the initiatives that they're doing. I have been able to participate in a few learning opportunities that the state's provided, um, and that's been really helpful in planning our curriculum review as awesome. we're really focused and working on math this year. So mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that there will be more opportunities that the state provides to us through that um, like they are for literacy. Is there someone on, I'm just curious, I don't, I don't have the list in front of me, but I know that literacy has been a focus from the state, which then has, you know, that's how we've gotten funding mm -hmm. for different things and including um, literacy coaching. Is there someone on the teaching and learning team who is focused, like you are in literacy, focused on math, or is that kind of like for now, because the funding hasn't come for that yet, everyone's, it's kind of an all hands on deck I would say it's all hands on deck, and I sort of split thinking about math and literacy. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, we do have um, Sherry Sunin is on our teaching and learning team. She's the MTSS coordinator um, at Pleasant Ridge, and she joins us for teaching and learning and adds a lot of math expertise to our teaching and learning team. But we don't have someone that's like, um, at this point, they're not like, paying for us to have a math coach like they right. are for literacy. Okay. Um, I can connect with you later, too, uh, about a, a, a possible connection that could be helpful, but um, I think that we're on the right path <laughs> as far as that goes, and I, um, if this voice gets to whoever is in the state, <laughs> yeah. uh, I think the um, equitable funding for literacy and math yeah. could be really positive. So. Definitely. Um, and then these are questions you can like get back to me on, but I am curious a little bit um, with some of the changes in um, in the the data that we're using now. Is there a triangulation of data, or are we relying primarily on Acadians? Is there a way for us to kind of think about like I, I know sometimes when we are assessing kids, um, one assessment might show something different, or they might show the same, and so having a few different data points. So that was one question I had. And then I also was curious about um, the administration of the assessments for our youngest learners because I know when I was here, and that was a while ago now, but um, we had our literacy support people were coming in and doing those assessments, but classroom teachers were doing some assessments too, but NWA was very easy, well, not very easy, but easier for classroom teachers to administer than Acadians, which is, I th I'm assuming, a one-on-one -on -one still. Okay, so just wondering about administration, and, and you, again, you don't have to answer tonight. I just, that I was, those were some things that I was curious. I can answer your first question pretty mm -hmm. quickly. Um, one of our goals this year that we've seen happen in first trimester is that grade level or departments are doing data digs in order to triangulate data. So we've been trying to provide departments and grade levels with the data they need, whether it's the data we're compiling for board presentations, if it's our state data, and that they can pair that with their classroom assessment. So in literacy this year, we have our Acadians data that Caroline shared. But we also started new diagnostic assessments that the classroom teachers were giving that really drilled down on the specific skills. And so what classroom teachers were able to do was to dig into that data plus Acadians, plus observations they're seeing in their classroom when they you know, meet with students individually. And then in math, we have our everyday math assessments. We also have Acadians assessments. So really encouraging um, classroom teachers to be thinking about lots of different kinds of data when they're making decisions about what their students need next. And I think it's always a, it's always a um, compromise between uh, triangulating data and not collecting too much data. So we, I think we shared um, earlier that we have a new data protocol that we're using mm -hmm. and there's a heavy focus on that. I say, I'll say that I've been really excited because I think this year, uh, more than any other year in early uh, childhood, we have better triangulation of data. 
certainly when you know we look at our foundational skills assessments that our teachers are giving and cadence they match a whole lot better than um, than previously when we were using found spinel in k1 primarily um, so that's been really exciting and we've done some digging with math as well with again comparing the everyday math um, assessments with Acadians, but I will say again, th the reason that we brought Acadians in the first place is because we were lacking a measure that hit on automaticity with some of these foundational skills. So in that sense, we're not able to fully, you know, it's, it, we're not measuring the same thing twice, but we are triangulating that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I mean, just because this is something that we do too, there is also, I think, as we have kids in school mm -hmm. across years, there's also the historical data that can sometimes help us with mm -hmm trends for individual students too so okay that's great thanks so much okay. and i do just want to take this quick opportunity because i know we're kind of getting along on time i'm happy to take any more questions you know via email I'm happy to jot them down take a couple more here um, but just to mention the fact that last year we were talking about building the muscle of examining data at a district-wide level and this year i would also say this that we are really in it now where our, our teachers have access to the data uh, sets that they need in order to make decisions that are informing their instruction um, so while it is the same presentation, we are actually in this all the time um, and sharing this. So it's a, it's a neat place to be in terms of our growth as a district and our, our processes. And that's the point, right? Yeah, it is. Using yeah, data really to plan instruction. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Two quick comments or questions from the end of the table. Yeah, absolutely. Brad. All righty. Um, yeah, I'll try to be efficient here. Uh, so the first thing is as far as doing a fall and a spring update, um, well, that's fine with me. Um, I do think that you know teaching and learning and celebrating our successes is important, right? So, like at the end of the day, if you want to take as much time of Mars as you want to <laughs> with this, I'm all for it. Um, Thank you. <laughs> the second yeah. thing, I'm wondering. Okay, there's a ton of data here. I so I will tell you when I sift through this, I, I for example look for like I'll tell you one thing I look for is like the kids who are in 2020 learning how to read, right? And mm -hmm. then I start sifting through and I go to first grade and I'm trying to find those kids. In second grade, I'm trying to find those kids. Could there be value, and tell me no if this is, in putting the class of and what the grade is so I could track them on the data? Oh, just it, it would just be easier for me. I'm laughing because just today I looked at Caroline and I said, I think it's time for us to do a class of for the um, K-5 data. Okay. Because we're doing that for the state data, we've tracked the class of, um, but our local data we haven't yet, so we will look into that. Obviously, creating all of these charts with the data, I, I would share. Like, it's hard. Like, there's a lot of numbers and data sets. So and I don't want to come no, across ungrateful. No, it's just I, I want to be able to look at and see. Oh my gosh, they went from here to here to here yes. to here. Because I know there's incredible work going, and I'm sure there's targeted interventions that are happening yes. specifically to meet those things. And so, like, I want to be able to say, look at where we were, and look at where we are now. So anyway, so that's yeah, just it was on our list, thought. and okay. yes, we are exploring that next step to show well, that, to I, tell that story. And I yeah. and I appreciate that. Yeah, okay, you're welcome. I'll, I'll say one. I just have to say one of the challenges I've had that has kept us in this task that I think we're going to figure out how to push yeah. through is that when you do that, the longer you go in time, the more sh that population changes. Mm -hmm. So it's a different Got it. Thing. And so to do it right, what you actually need to do is take each individual student, right. populate their data in the spreadsheet, and then redo the analysis right. every single right. time for all the years. Right. So that you're tracking apples to apples. Like Fair that's enough. what's really critical. Yeah. So it's not that we haven't wanted to be in the past. We will work on it. Yeah. It's just really hard. All right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and, and I will also, I mean, as an educator myself, different cohorts and different, I mean, sh things just yep. change and like surprise us sometimes, right? So anyway, okay, so thank you for that. Um, you know, you said a couple of times, like, I don't know how to explain this or that. And, and I get that, right? But I'm wondering then how often are we engaging in K-12 conversations where you get to hear from the educators, this is why we, because I, I think there might be tremendous value in just putting your ear in that room and saying, oh, this is the class where that happened. This is the class, oh, where we were tracking that. And, you know, we had GI flu that had our kids out for X number of days. And anyway, so. Yeah. We actually do have an audience for that in the curriculum review. And as a part okay. of the second year, we're coming back to the updated data and talking through those items. So that is on our list of things to um, incorporate into this year. The second year of each curriculum review is to revisit the data and what is it telling us 
um, and what notes do we need to make. To Caroline's credit, she keeps a copious timeline of all the changes we've made in the district. Um, so I that don't we can doubt start that. To match. And the yeah. reason that I'm saying I don't know is because these don't match with one another. He wants you to go to the, yeah. he wants to go to the mic so you can be heard all, all, all around the world here. So. Sorry, I'm going to be quick. Uh, the reason that I, I'm saying I can't explain it is because they don't match the changes that I know have happened curricular, uh, curriculum-wise and with other things. It's not because I'm not talking to teachers or I'm not gathering that data. Oh, I, I don't believe that at all. It's because I don't, it, there's not a consistent trend with yeah. the other things that have happened. With that. Right, but we have to create that time, too, and, and that opportunity, right? Yeah. So, all right, and then um, I noticed on the absences, right, in high school, we really see a significant increase, 11th and 12th grade, in our absences, um, and especially in the spring. So do we have any thoughts on that? Do you want to take that and put it in your back pocket and think about it? And <laughs> <laughs> do you want to give my best stab, Beth, and then? So um, some things that we've talked about related to absences. Uh, this is the attendance data from this, mo this past year, um, is that like many things with the, our data polls, this is not necessarily pulling out our student athletes who are leaving. It's or not. Who I it's figured not. it was. No. Oh. It's just mis it's missed instruction. Yeah. It's Sorry. missed instruction. So the students who missed twenty percent or more of a given class of instruction. Right. So when we do our weekly, like I pull this data every week for the high school and the middle school, and we only do excuse and unexcuse and kind of look at that because yeah. we don't pick, pull the medicals or we're not pulling. Um, college visits and all that stuff. But the end of the year, we're really looking at missed instruction because that's what that's how it's defined and when the state right. asks for that data. Um, so yes, especially in the spring when a lot of golf and you know those they're leaving fifth hour and that kind of thing. Um, so that's highly reflected, but it's still a pretty high percentage. So when we are looking at when we looked at the data from Tri One in our meeting a couple weeks ago, we're like we're, we're we can't have hundred we have hundreds of kids. Where are our students that we should focus on? And we're looking at the intersection of attendance and grades really. Like right. where, who are the kids that are on both? Yeah. Um, and, and bring your interventions to that group of students first. So. No, I'll totally get it. And I'm not surprised to hear you say it was sports. Like, yeah. I, I, that I, I figured and I got the answer I thought I'd get. The and then the last thing is, is there any type of um, hiring supports, any type of thing where we're like, we're targeting for this position or that position right now? I tend to ask that. In terms of like of, new of, positions? Of need. I mean, this is a mic moment where we need this. We are looking for that. Like, <laughs> Specifically, so we are. Um, so we actually have access to the 31 AA grant. Um, this this particular question might be easier for me to answer with more of my notes from my office. Um, in that, we got 31 AA. We did. We do, we do have some staffing inside of that particular grant. That's both the mental health, social, uh, SEL, and then safety and security. Uh, we had 23G, which we had not received, but now it sounds like we might. So my, my fingers are crossed. I would like all of you to cross your fingers because I don't want it to be a state error for that one. Um, and then, of course, looking at you know leveraging our at-risk funding um, if we needed to do or make any supports or shifts in staffing. So we do have some ideas around that. Um, some of it's a funding piece, so I will definitely send a response to that. Fair enough. I appreciate Thank you guys. You. Thank you to wrap things up, Trustees Austin, then Estep. Mine's pretty quick. Um, uh, Trustee Gold actually mentioned one thing about the data and the math and stuff, so that kind of makes sense. Because it was interesting to look at pre-COVID in the reading and, you know, like the grades and where we're at now. Even though the trend seems to be going up, still not to where it was in 18, 19 years. And so it had been nice to kind of see what math was like, too, but we really don't have that data. So... Um, so that was an interesting thing that I noted. Um, also really like the uh, uh, school and family partnership. I know 15 people doesn't sound like a lot, but actually 15 people showing up at any event yeah. is a lot. So <laughs> I think that's encouraging that you had that. And I, so, so don't quit that. Because I think at the end of the day, the partnership with families in our child's education is huge. And I think that's yeah, reflected in you can look from school to school and mm -hmm. see which fam which school districts have more family engagement? Mm -hmm. um, it's reflected. The other thing is, and I don't know, you got tons of data here, and you guys comb through tons of data, so maybe it's not, you know, easy, or, or maybe it's not even really available. How how do you guys see our peer districts' information and how they're doing compared to like us, post pandemic mm -hmm. and stuff? Oh, we have access to state level data, um, and I do have a chart for that. And again, it's not apples to apples, so we. 
we give it a cursory glance um, in terms of state level data. Um, and then of course we partner with our, our peer districts in a lot of different ways. So as curriculum directors, we're often in conversation and collaborating. There's more collaboration now than I um, ever remember there being, and especially in this particular curriculum instruction level, MTSS has started under um, just I think the fruition of Caroline's leadership alongside of Beth and bringing county MTSS coordinators together. So they're actually like, we're looking at scaling up and leveling success for all students. Yes, of course, for Celine and then, uh, you know, equitably across our county. Um, and so I know there's a lot of data sh and anecdotal evidence shared inside of those conversations as well. And of course, Jen's working as a literacy coach alongside of our county peers. And I think that's been a fabulous shift because it helps us be reflective when we have these reflective conversations about data and it also helps our peers um, and we learn from each other and lifts all students up at the same time. Um, and that's pretty great. So, so are we kind of seeing the same trend with the other schools? Um, you know, still maybe not up to yeah. pre-pandemic levels? In terms or? of our state, data or that I presented on the fall, yes. So we are on trend nationally and then we still outperform the national trends in terms and, and our peer districts in many categories. Not in all, um, and it really depends. Again, not apples to apples, um, but you know, I'm comfortable with where we are in relationship to the state. I would like us to continue to make improvements and address some of the places that we've been inquiring about for the last couple of years. Um, and we are also still uh, in a really good place. In fact, in our consultation with Sarah Paul, she actually said, you guys should be really proud of your math data and what it's showing as a result of this. And Jen and I were on that phone call, and I think we both, if, if we had a mic to drop, we would have dropped it. Uh, because it, we, we, I think, are so critical often of ourselves and our district performance when we are really doing a great job and our students alongside of their mental health, you know, the family trauma, um, you know, being whole people we're in a, in a great place as a district, and I'm really proud of the work that our teachers and our teams are doing to uh, lift up kids socially, emotionally, and academically, and we're seeing that come along. So, yeah. Yes, this is a follow-up, I believe, um, from a year ago, because <laughs> I had to look in my email, um, and Carolyn had uh, responded. Um, but whenever we're talking about um, race and ethnicity and populations that um, we're identifying um, and looking at the dis dis I, oh disproportionality, gosh. it's Thank a rough you. one. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> Say that five times mm -hmm. fast. Um, I know um, what came up um, was the um, multiracial, biracial, mm -hmm. and um, I know the answer then you were, you were going to um, ask. Um, I'm not going to talk about the gender piece here because that wasn't in the data, um, but I know that's something they were working on a year ago. Um, but yeah, I was just curious if there was any um, sort of update um, with that and, you know, if they're too, like, they're coming up in the data, but I think you said in one category and how is, how is that decided? Yeah, so unfortunately, I don't have an update. That, that The issue last year we discussed was the power school categorization. Mm -hmm. um, that is still an issue, but in the interim, we've also switched power school people. Um, so I actually was supposed to have a meeting today that I wasn't able to have. I will follow up and see if it's in the docket. I'm not in... I'm not in as closely with like the what's going to come in power school. I know it's not out yet. I know that's something they were working on, but unfortunately that with all this data, you know, as uh, Trustee Austin also helped us point out, or uh, sorry, Trustee uh, um, um, Gerby, um, we're bound by the, the systems that we're using in order to do these analyses. And that's one of the biggest like issues with it, right, is the categories that power school forces us to choose and makes us choose one or the other, um, then dictate what we can pull. Sorry, I wish I had a better answer yeah, for you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that, that will help with, um, I guess maybe, maybe a follow-up of like how, I, I don't remember, because I, I have a um, multi, multiracial child and I don't remember if it's primary race or <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure in how that, like. There's not even an option of primary, secondary right now. Okay. Okay, thank you. 
Well, thank you to the whole team for helping us drink from the fire hose of data <laughs> this evening that you're so familiar with, just to give us a taste of what it is that you do day in and day out. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank and you so much for all the, the thoughtful questions as well. Please reach out via email if there's anything else that comes up afterwards. We appreciate you. I'd like to uh, jump into the three discussion items we have. Hopefully, the first one's going to be pretty quickly, and it's, oh, it's presented by me. Um, once again, I mean, Don Wotruba has asked us all to, uh, to put our hats in if we're interested in running for uh, the, the MASB Board of Directors. And I did it two years ago, as you may recall, and thank you very much for your support. I appreciate that. And there are three candidates ran. Uh, the, the incumbent beat me by three districts out of, I think it's 140 in Region 7. And there was a third candidate who, who pulled in about 15 or so. So I'd like to give it another crack this year. It's a different incumbent this year. His name is Dale Wingard. And, uh, we voted for him ages ago, but this time I'd like you to change that vote <laughs> for me. Um, I, By the way, if those are concerned about overextending myself, I just rolled off my, my sixth year on the International Society for Technology and Education board of directors, so that's done, and I'm just rattling around in my calendar looking for another project to do. <laughs> more, stuff to do. more stuff to do. So um, I, I, will, I will be able to have that time. Plus, this year I served on the Governmental Relations Committee, which has been fascinating to see. Like I discussed the other, and, and, and Trustee Eastep has seen this before in, in some of those fascinating committee meetings. There's not rubber stamping that goes on up there in Lansing. We actually have some pretty spirited debates before we land on an issue and, and either support or, or don't support particular legislative issues. So uh, I'm looking forward to that again. And if you would, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to support President who, who Michael McVeigh as candidate for the MASB Board of Directors for Region 7. The election starts on January 26th. So. Well, Michael, I am very happy to support you. You're saying no? And, uh, no, no, I, I motion <laughs> as such. Okay, thank you. Support Jay Miller, thank you very much. <coughs> if you have any questions to ask me, now's your chance. Okay, hearing no questions. Can, can there be some math? I'm still math impressed. Yeah, can we have math? Well, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Go ahead. Still thinking I'm, about I'm the good up to grade five. <laughs> I'm kidding. Maybe six, and statistics. Um, so all in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Looking at you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Betty Yankee will uh, make a, write a quick letter that I have to include with my application paperwork. And the deadline is January 9th or 10th, uh, but uh, we'll get there. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to uh, open it up to uh, 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 Secretary Miller. Please, it's these it's these honorifics that I keep getting messed up. Uh, Secretary Miller, uh, Chair of Policy Committee, who met today. So could you fill us in, please? Thank you. So we did end up uh, wrapping up our year together on the Policy Committee tonight. Um, we do have a couple of loose ends that are hanging over. So um, tonight I'll tell you about what, um, I'll give you a preview, but we're going to really talk more about that later, of what we did tonight. And then the two things that are hanging over to um, whomever is going to be on the policy committee in 2024. So tonight on our agenda, we had one item, and it was uh, to... Um, to continue talking about our uh, gun safety and safe gun um, storage uh, conversation that has been ongoing for the last couple of years. And so uh, we'll get a report on that, uh, not a report, but we'll actually have a, a reading of a resolution that is being proposed from the policy committee um, for tonight. I guess we didn't really vote on it, but I think we're all unanimous in bringing it forward. So. Um, the plan at that meeting was to bring it forward tonight, and so you'll notice that that is on the agenda. Uh, we had pre well, uh, Trustee Eastup and Trustee Gold had uh, preemptively asked for it to be on the agenda um, in anticipation that we would move it forward tonight. So you'll hear that in just a moment. Um, and then um, as we wrap up, there is um, one policy, and I will take the blame for this, that had been kind of hanging out there a little bit because we wanted to make sure that the policy was um, considering 
the new legislation around, well, not new, but newer, I guess, in the last year, legislation around the Crown Act. And um, so Secretary Yankee had uh, done some work for us in looking, and um, our current iteration of the policy is in agreement with that legislation. And so um, it should be fairly easy in January. That should um, we're, we're requesting that whoever is on that committee, that that be the first order of business so that we can not leave that um, hanging over again because it is a hangover from, from last year. <laughs> so, um, but we did have, we, did, we were, were waiting on some guidance around that um, legislation that was in process at the end of last year and then came um, to be this year. So we have that. And then the other thing, um, there is uh, a new person who is coordinating with us um, from NEOLA. Her name is Melody Strang and um, Secretary Yonke and um, Superintendent Lotch and I had met with her um, a couple of months ago with the NEOLA updates that uh, were the current NEOLA updates that were brought to you, um, I think, was it in November or October? <laughs> I think it was October. Um, and so we passed those. But when we met with Melody, she did mention that there were a couple of um, updates or iterations that had um, not uh, been met, whether due to our missing that or the um, change in personnel at Neola. So she did mention to us that there were a few things, nothing that was critical, but some things that she wanted to make us aware of and um, for our consideration. So those two things, uh, we want to just have whoever is the new um, policy chair and the 2024 policy committee um, take up those two things as um, they begin their work in 2024. So that concludes the policy work in 2023. Thank you to uh, Trustee Eastup and Trustee Gold for their work, um, Dr. Latch always, and of course <laughs> our, uh, our wonderful recording secretary, Betty also. <laughs> she does a lot of work for us, so we appreciate that. Um, and so uh, with that, I'm going to end my report so that we can move to the rest of the policy committee and their update and recommendation um, for our next piece. If I could just say thank you also to the policy committee. It is not easy uh, at times. Some of the policies are very short putts and others are very heavy lifts. And I just want to say that you, you all have been taking uh, the work very seriously and uh, I appreciate your time. So who is doing the resolution? Thank you. Um, so we had um, talked about, I believe, um, Trustee Gerby and Trustee Miller um, wanted, uh, so it was brought to the policy committee um, through their recommendation for us to look at um, possible res bringing a resolution because we've, we've talked about that. Um, we've had other board members um, say that they would like to see um, this come to the table. Uh, and then there was also a question of um, policy. Um, and so um, Trustee Gold and I um, you know, took this piece on because um, Jenny has done so much, thank you. <laughs> um, and so, um, we, you know, talked about it, and, um, you know, there's so many laws that have been uh, passed this past year um, with our, um, in the state of Michigan, and so um, there are probably maybe NEOLA updates in the future, um, but for this specifically, um, we um, aren't deciding on a policy that could be explored in 2024, um, but uh, definitely wanted to bring the resolution um, we worked on this um, together and um, looked at Chelsea uh, School District and also um, Northville. I believe that's right, Northville. Um, and so um, Northville had a very, you know, to the point resolution. Um, and then Chelsea, and these are recent ones that were passed, and Chelsea was very, um, you know, um, detailed uh, bullet point kind of thing and so we um, kind of brought brought pieces of that together um, I think it's we've seen these past couple of years um, that's been you know brought brought to us 
Um, and uh, so, yeah, this is what we um, came up with. And uh, so we are happy to read that. Um, do you want to help with that? Or I could read part of it and you read the other. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so a resolution in support of gun safety and safe gun storage, Saline Area Schools District of Board of Education, whereas the safety and well-being of our students, teachers, and staff is a top priority in Saline Area Schools District. Whereas the state of Michigan established gun violence prevention legislation requiring universal background checks for all firearm purchases and safe storage requirements. Whereas in 2020, firearm related injuries surpassed motor vehicle crashes to become the leading cause of death among people ages 1 to 19 in the United States. Whereas a report from the U.S. Secret Service emphasizes that 76% of attackers involved in gun violence incidents on school grounds obtain firearms from the homes of parents or close relatives. Whereas five firearm suicides account for the loss of nearly 22,000 American lives annually, including over 950 children and teenagers. Whereas research reveals that almost half of firearm owners with children at home do not securely store at least one of their weapons. Whereas evidence strongly suggests that secure firearm storage is an essential component to any effective strategy to keep our community safe. Whereas it is the collective responsibility of all adult stakeholders within the Saline Area School District to ensure the safety of students, teachers, and staff against the threat of gun violence. Whereas the urgency to enhance student and school safety necessitates urgent action. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the board and superintendent will continue to work with local law enforcement agencies, medical and mental health agencies, and nonprofit organizations to cl collaborate on promoting the safety of students and staff. Be it further resolved that the board directs the superintendent to increase efforts to inform the district community of their legal obligations regarding secure storage of firearms in their homes, as well as other gun violence prevention safety measures. Be it further resolved that the board directs the superintendent to regularly communicate the importance of safe firearm storage and other firearm safety and violence prevention measures to the district during Gun Violence Awareness Month and at other appropriate times and be it further resolved that this resolution shall not be construed to conflict with any existing Michigan or federal law. And the last section is for um, when, when that resolution is, uh, if that resolution is passed and signed. Any discussion? So I just wanted to, um, to say that this um, in particular has been um, an ongoing um, conversation at our table for the last couple of years. And um, when I think about a resolution such as this and the impact of, um, of crimes that involve guns um, inflicted upon students um, around, around the world, but especially in the United States, um, on the heels of an incident last week, and also two days before the anniversary of Sandy Hook that I know as an elementary school teacher had a great impact, huge impact on, um, on me as an elementary teacher. Um, and so when I think about those instances and the conversations that we've had the last couple of years, um, I appreciate that this, um, that this resolution takes into account the impact of um, of guns on uh, schools and on our students and um, uh, school aged students. I also appreciate that it isn't calling for the restriction of um, of guns or anything like that. That can be um, very um, 
difficult to navigate in a community with with very different ideas around that. But what it is calling for is unity around safety for our students. And so I appreciate the focus in this particular resolution and, and others like it that have passed in other districts that really focus on safe storage and um, keeping our students safe through that safe storage. And I wanted to also mention that uh, the city has passed, it's been a while now, but they passed a similar resolution and that um, the uh, um, Chief Radzik uh, of the um, Sleen area, or Sleen Police Department, um, has also been um, vocal in supporting efforts to, um, to support uh, community members and families in the act of safe, safe storage. And so if there are families or individuals in our community that do not have access to um, safe storage, such as gun locks, they are free and available from the police department, and you can stop and get those at any time, no questions asked. Um, and so I am in support of this resolution. I know that it's not our tendency to always pass resolutions such as this, um, and I, I know that there is also the fear that perhaps we could be flooded with requests for resolutions. And to that, uh, I just want to say that um, the board is always uh, open to hearing from people, as we often do, and would consider any request just as we considered this, and that at the request of Brad and I, um, Lauren, and I'm sorry, I should say Trustee Gold and Trustee Eastep took up the work to find um, the best uh, resolution for us, and in talking with Dr. Latch today during our um, policy meeting, the therefore be it resolved section seems very doable and in alignment with a lot of the partnerships and activities that are already either in process or planned for the future. So I think that um, I think that a resolution such as this can be a really positive thing for our community and for our teachers and staff and students. So thank you for the work that you did on this. I have, oh, go ahead. Well, I've got two questions, a comment, and a note. Good. Uh, first of all, um, regarding the potential for f floods uh, of, of resolutions, and I appreciate that comment, and you, you let it out. Um, I'm, I think that running such resolutions through the policy committee first is actually a very smart move on, on our part, and I think it'll... Um, it's a it's a good thing rather than bring it to us at the the, the board table. Uh, it, I'd, it'd be great if it was carefully considered by the policy committee. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, secondly, I did want to also recognize that Superintendent Lotch and his team have been working on efforts already, and I know you alluded to it and mentioned it, and I appreciate that, including, and this will lead to a question in a second, uh, to, to Treasurer Gerby, uh, about a recent meeting that we had, and you actually sat down with some of the key people behind the, the Be Smart group, uh, <laughs> Susie, Sue Treber and Monique Hunter, thank you. And um, I'm curious to hear, my question is going to be, I'm curious to hear what uh, came of that meeting. And uh, the last thing, I actually did some research and found out that gun violence or gun, gun violence awareness month is June. If you didn't know that, that was the more you know, right? Thank you. So, Treasurer Gerby, what uh, came of that meeting? Well, I, I'll be honest with you, it was rather brief just due to the fact that it was an audience of Superintendent Lotch and I. <laughs> so they shared with us a uh, fine outstanding <laughs> audience indeed. So they they shared with us, you know, publications that they they had and their resolution. Their resolution in my opinion like echoes a lot of the language that is that is here um, and I'm not surprised like they came to us and and brought that to us and and so I guess to answer your question I would say that those are the kinds of things that they they talk about and you know and they really stressed this piece and, and Jenny just spoke to this beautifully about about us talking about safety for our students safety for our staff safety for for people in our schools and about storage and that that was like their primary focus and not necessarily the piece about you know whether or not how we feel about gun ownership and those types of things in general uh, because I agree that those are personal 
um, things for, for a lot of people and for, they feel that way passionately about it for their family and their own personal safety and some of those kinds of things. So, but their argument is entirely rooted in this storage piece and about making sure that um, you know, our students don't have access to firearms or at least so we can limit those things to the areas where they should have access, shooting teams and you know, that kind of thing, right? So I guess I would, I would say that. Uh, and I guess while I have the mic, I, I will state my, um, my strong, strong, strong uh, preference for this resolution and my strong support to stand behind it. And I wanna thank the team for, for taking this on and bringing this and, and quite frankly getting it to us in 2023. I, um, I guess my question would be, can I propose, can I propose that a motion to, to pass this right now? And to say, I don't wanna leave this loose end. And I, I think we should finish our 2023 business. So I guess I, barring, and we could I still have I think Tim discussion. and I should have yeah. the opportunity to speak in our student representatives as well. Well, and I totally agree with that. If I made the motion, wouldn't that allow us to still have discussion? You asked the question as the presiding officer. I think yeah, yes, you're welcome to make a motion later. But as as a, a I vice president, that. I really as do. Vice President Seven said, let's uh, let's just continue Fine the conversation, and then and then I'll look at you, and you can say what you're going to say. All for it. Okay, so first of all, I, I think it's no shock that I would support something along these lines. Um, so thank you for the work that you've done. Um, I, I would respectfully request, um, I worked today, so I didn't get an opportunity to read this. Um, and I know, uh, and I listened and, and since went into the email, um, but it would have been nice to have in the board packet as well, so the public could read it as well and we could read it. And I know that's probably because you were busy writing it, so it's no slight uh, on that. Um, we, we did request um, to have it put, um, on the agenda um, and then um, President McVeigh um, I, I mean he could speak but um, I believe he didn't want it in the packet because we were going to have an update at the policy committee so um, I didn't yeah I know there's there's yeah. definitely so, so that that it wouldn't have gone into yeah. the packet is what I'm trying to say it's just the, the process of re resolutions is not one that we are um, squeaky clean on right now For because sure. we haven't done a lot of them, yeah. and so I I believe that um, that prof that Dr. Uh, President McVeigh, sorry, <laughs> all the different names, um, <laughs> President McVeigh wanted the policy meeting to or policy meeting to happen first, and um, unfortunately that happened right before this, so we wanted to read it today, but definitely. Um, that is something that uh, we would definitely take into consideration for if there are future resolutions. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and the, and the point is, I mean, just obviously being respectful of our time um, and, and daily things that we're involved in. So getting things last minute, you wanna try to look at it, but like w what I would do is I would request data sources on some of the things and wanna review and maybe there's some other great data or maybe you know, just being able to read those data sources. I mean, from the academic perspective, I think is a, is a good thing to do. Um, and the other, there was one other thing that I was thinking about. Um, um, yeah, and, and as it relates to the public, that was that was the other piece, just having time to um, obviously agree, agree with everything, but like wanting to ingest it, wanting to look at the data sources, and then wanting the public to be able to, so to review and or comment. And I, I do realize that this is not like a policy, so there is not a set protocol, but it's nice to be able to have it. It is, and, and just, just to follow up and not to say that, that not to discredit anything that you're saying, but the data that is included in this resolution has been presented to the board over the last two years, so it isn't new data to us um, and has been um, a part of uh, the packet and, and information sent to us from Monique and Susie. So just, just as a point of um, letting you know that it isn't new if you've had a chance to read those pieces too. And so. just a note of clarification, so, and uh, I, it's not I that I did one not one. want to put it in the packet, I did not have anything to put in the packet, so. Okay, <laughs> um, so okay the, I misread the email then. So the data in here is from two years ago in the board. Mo I made the observation that we can't get 
most of the okay, data so you comes guys from updated. every town. Okay, that's uh, a research and policy. I could, I can source it, and I mean, we. I think it's completely reasonable. I wasn't sure if we should leave, like, but that that's where most of it comes. We also have CDC data. That was one of the reasons we. I took the time and kind of looked at when we met. I went through and checked all of them because I wanted to make sure. I think the Chelsea, one of the two policy or resolutions that we drew from had even more data in it. And I thought, you know, we want this resolution to be somewhat lasting. And so if it changes in five years, but people are going back and looking at the resolution, which hopefully it does, hopefully it goes down and things look better in five years, that would be wonderful. Um, so, you know, yeah, I think you can make an argument that maybe it has too much data in it, but I think the reason that we wanted that data is that, I, at least for, I'm only gonna speak for myself. For me, I wanted to speak to the community and say, this is why we consider this to be of urgent uh, board priority and um, priority for the community and the district. So, um, but I think that's really reasonable and whether it goes out at the end of 2023 or the beginning of 2024, it doesn't, you know, that's, I think that's, but that's where we were at with it. Thank you, Trustee. And no slight meant to the work and, and the, the goal here overall, of course. Just, I'm thinking of it from a process perspective. Thank you, Trustee Gold. <laughs> uh, Tim. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, uh, we'll start out with the good notes. So, on a good note, the first whereas I agree with on this policy or this uh, resolution. After that, I don't really agree with it. The Be Smart is a national. Uh, this is from the Be Smart thing. Be Smart is a national campaign to educate adults on the importance of gun safety storage, safe storage. So, we are a board to educate students, not adults. We weren't hired to educate adults. If we wanted to do something to promote gun safety for students, why don't we have like the Eddie the Eagle program or something like that in, in our K through three? Um, instead, we have a policy that really, it, 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 it's telling adults how to store their guns. And I guess I'll, I, I'm very irritated that this is in here. I'll just be frank. Um, and I'll use terms that I don't really like here and here in the school district, like privilege. We're, we're going to sit up here in our privileged community, and we're going to tell, and, and oh, look at us. We're, we're going to pass a resolution to tell you how to uh, lock, properly lock up your guns and your ammunition. doesn't matter if you are in a less fortunate area where crime is important or crime is prevalent, and this is your way of protecting your family. You know, I, I, I'm, the, the, you know, why don't we have a whereas it, when, we, when we, this came up, uh, after the MSU shooting and after more evidence came out where like the prosecuting attorney let off that shooter on a felony firearms charge and reduced it. You know, why, why don't we have a whereas in there for something like that? Like if you're a prosecuting attorney or a judge that allows a felony firearm charge to be reduced, they should be held accountable. We're not saying that in here. I mean, there are so many things um, this district has that are relevant as far as we are looming debt, uh, a budget crisis, we are, are losing students, and yes, we wanna say it's about you know birth rates and this and that, but frankly, it's about bringing stuff like this at the board table that a lot of people in this district feel it steps outside of our, our, our uh, purview. We're stepping outside of our lane. So how many, I guess I do have a question, how many um, school districts in Michigan have passed this month? The be smart. I think is it over. Thir I I can look it up, but um, it's from it seventy was a, to eighty percent, about ten percent of the school districts. And I I will add that. Um, it's about ten percent of the school district is. Uh, so in March, the state board of education adopted a resolution on safe school environments, um, and then the common sense gun safety legislation. And then um, five months before that, so that was this year, um, they had did a resolution on urging um, the legislation to um, do this as well for the safe storage. Yeah, and the legislation passed some. If the, if the legislation has some authority over adults, I get it. They can do that. I don't have to agree with it. I don't see where we as a school board have the authority to, 
you know, pass a resolution to tell adults how they're going to keep their guns safe. Um, I well, it, it just it. I just think that um, I think this is once again another thing that it, it is at the board table that can can be perceived by our community that is divisive. It's not bringing community members together, and this is why we have students leaving, parents pulling their kids. That's all I'm going to say. Res respectfully, it seems like it's exactly the kind of parent family uh, school partnership that you were just referencing that you agree with because to me it wasn't us trying to tell adults what to do but to say this is the data we have this data regarding this risk to our children we know that I, I don't think you'd find a parent in the community who doesn't hold their breath some days when they send their kids off to school so there's parents being prosecuted in the state of Michigan right now for their guns being accessed by a student to kill other students. So it just seems to me like we're not telling them what to do. We're just trying to provide information like this is a risk that we can mediate. And, and I think that that is I, I am perfectly fine if the uh, the state wants to prosecute a parent because they didn't lock up their gun and somebody did something like that. I, I have no problem with that. But, uh, you know, we can be doing this like Dr. Lotch did already, hold a community event and have adults come to it if that's what we want to do, or do something productive in the classroom to teach gun safety. I think this resolution, and especially Be Smart, is a national campaign to educate adults. I mean, this is not about educating kids, it's about educating adults, and we are a school board to educate kids. So I'm not in favor of it, we're not going to agree on it, but that's fine. Um, I would like to, to add um, that, and I don't know if this was specifically in the first point, um, but safe storage was signed into law, so um, we're not necessarily, I mean, we're educating, right, as a, as a community. We, we do, there is a community component whenever we talk about um, the senior center, um, we have uh, Celine Community Ed, so we are a community. Um, you know, it is required by law, um, and you know, I think this is um, something with an educational component. Um, I did like our conversation during policy um, because it isn't prescri prescriptive. Like uh, some of some of the the resolutions that we did look at, um, which was very much like the instructional piece, like. Um, you know, and, and that would have possibly been a burden. Um, and so, you know, we, we did this in partnership with, um, you know, asking the superintendent what um, his needs um, may be. Um, and then also just kind of, we talked about some creative ideas of, you know, maybe um, creating a, you know, a task force or a committee or something. Um, and that it's, we would look at the com safety overall um, because that is something that uh, we're required to do as a board um, and partnering with community organizations and stuff for resources. So, Superintendent Lodge? Yeah, one thing I do want to just um, frame is what we really are doing because there really is a lot of interest in the community to support uh, safety and security in the schools. Trustee Austin mentioned it. We did hold a forum not too long ago, and we had really good attendance. And, and the community does want to support. The community has been doing a good job of supporting. We talk a lot about giving compliments to our community about when they see something that is strange or, or something that seems out of place. They tell us about it. That That's a big deterrent for, um, you know, people from coming into the district where, you know, you, 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 you don't want them coming in. And um, this is not now, and, and Kurt did a nice job with this uh, before um, his retirement. Rex is now leading the charge with our safety and security team. Our administration wants to talk about this often to a point where we've just scheduled ongoing meetings over the next two months just to talk about safety and security our new um, systems that we put in place, whether it's video or our Ricotta system to um, you know, come into the district, uh, inform a cast. And so uh, I do believe that this is part of it, 
um, you know, helping to support safety at home. But I don't want us to lose sight of is we're doing a lot to work on safety and security in the buildings. I just want to make sure that we're, we're framing that and we will continue to do so because it's, it's really important to our community and it's important to us as a school district. So, And I support that. First of all, Jenny Miller, then Brad. Um, I just wanted to say too that um, in, in the resolution, uh, the whereas um, statements are from data, they're not um, opinion pieces. Those are taken directly from, um, from data, and I know Lauren has said that she can share the um, actual um, origination of that data, but it's from um, CDC, it's from, um, I can't remember which other you one you mentioned, but the CDC and, uh, every town and some other places. So they are um, data pieces. Um, so those aren't necessarily opinion pieces. But because of those data pieces, um, the policy committee and um, just felt that the work that could be done to protect students um, would be a part of this resolution. And I, I want to say that we do things within the school district um, to protect students from things that happen outside of the school day. We just, in the last couple of months, had presentations from um, the Washington Children's Safe, I'm trying to remember the acronym, but from um, Susan Usher and her team. She came and talked to us about um, some things um, that would involve keeping children safe from um, child predators um, that typically happens outside of the school day. Also included in that are things like, um, we specifically referenced during policy committee today, um, it does reference weapons and safety. It referenced um, uh, toxins such as medications or alcohol. It references some of those things in there. And so while, a, while the idea of gun um, storage and safe gun storage happens outside of the school buildings and the school day, the data does show the impact of these particular incidents on school-aged children. And I don't think that we're completely off base if, if our own State Board of Education um, also took this up as an area that they um, passed. So although I can see where it is our primary duty to educate students it is, it is a safe environment that allows um, students to have um, uh, an, an environment that allows for that education. So um, just in response. Well said. Uh, yeah, like I think like when we, you know, talk about student safety, we have to talk about things that happen in the totality of our students' lives. And so for me, this reflects that. So for me, this resolution does keep our students safe. And we have adults who work in our schools who this resolution would also function to keep safe. So if, you want to talk, if we want to talk about the impact that that would have, I would say that this is also a strong message to our adult staff members about our commitment to that as well. So um, it still has my strong support and I, I understand um, Vice President Stebbins, you know, like wanting to see this sooner. I would have probably, I, yes, like I, if, if it wasn't such a passionate topic for me and it, and it is, uh, I, that, that is there. But if we wait until January to, to pass it, it, that's fine with me. Like we can request that it be put on the agenda and we can go that route. So I, I'd be open to the team and if you guys want to do it tonight, I'm all for it too. Well, we're looking to you for that because I think you were going to put a motion forward. You have a ch you have a, you're at a crossroads now. We can either try to do it tonight and let us think about it, or let us think about it for uh, a month. I, I can live with it. It's, it, I, I'm open to the discussion. If there's anybody else who feels that way, I understand the the desire to say let's digest it, let's get public comment on it. I, you know, that kind of thing. I but I'm open. And, and just to be clear about um, resolutions versus policy and bylaw, um, 
resolution resolutions are really I mean there's some like legal ones right <laughs> but like coming coming from the board um this is more of like an encouragement a statement um of support um and sort of an expectation that um we're given um you know the the board superintendent district um to do uh so it is not something that's um in our policies um or bylaws um and so there is a lot of um i guess freedom creativity and how um that information is um you know given and stuff so that's why it looks different um and maybe it's a future board operating procedure that gets you know put in the very lengthy <laughs> board operating procedure on policy um but um you know really it's just kind of a statement from our board um and um with our values and so yeah i just want to leave leave you with that that it's not um you know, not in policy, bylaw um, kind of thing that it's very, you know, structured to the point of you're required to do these things, um, but a strong encouragement. <laughs> well, let's leave it at that then. I'd like to thank the um, policy committee and those who spoke tonight, every one of you who spoke tonight, and um, it sounds like we should revisit this in the new year and make a decision then, um, and we'll talk about that with whoever the new board president is or whoever the new policy team people are, but we'll get there. Um, do I? Can I ask you real quick? You so, so will that be able to, um, I guess maybe, uh, Betty and Superintendent Lodge um, to go ahead and be put on that January agenda prior to having <laughs> um, prior to having our officers, you know, um, you to have to create an agenda. I would I would like to make a motion to have it put on the agenda in January as an action item for us to vote on. Thank you. I'd like to recommend. Uh, as, uh, Secretary Miller, that you stay out of my head because that's exactly where I was going to be. I'd like I'd like to second that if I may and support that. But, but just a point of clarification, it does have to be after the organizational meeting. Per oh, right, yeah, per law, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. I'm going to assume there's no more discussion on this. So, uh, all in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed. All right, we will see you again in January. I'm going to make a note. Of, I'm, Ms. Yankee's got it all. She's great. Um, administration and board updates, please. I'm starting with uh, Superintendent Lodge and then going over to uh, the high school table and moving across. Okay, sounds good. So I do want to thank uh, Kurt Ellis, who has retired from the district and worked here for over 10 years. Um, nobody worked harder than Kurt, and he really did revamp HR processes for us. We did not have uh, good processes and procedures in place. Um, and so we're, we're really thankful for Kurt's leadership in that area. Again, we welcomed uh, Carol Diglio tonight. We're excited for her role here as interim assistant superintendent, in, interim assistant superintendent of human resources. I also wanted to congratulate our Celine Middle School robotics teams for for people that are paying close attention to their they are ha they're on an incredible run. There's three middle school robotics teams, and they just recently at a tournament placed first, second, and third for their, for their teams. And then their most recent success is they're, they're actually setting a world, they've set a world record for points in what's called center stage. It's their game that they're, they're participating in. And there's like 10,000 teams across the U.S. This is a, a really big deal. Um, and so we're excited to have them here for a superintendent recognition at the January 23rd meeting. But this is a really big deal. 
I'm really excited about it from the standpoint of these are our middle school kids that are going to get to experience the STEAM Center when it's built at the high school. So the timing of this is great. It's really setting the stage for, um, you know, a terrific teamwork, uh, collaboration area to be able to move into a state-of-the-art center where they already have a robotics field set up. So it's just a really exciting time for not only the team but the, but the district. Um, I also want to say congratulations to Sarah Youssef. She is one of our Foundation for Selene Area Schools student trustees. She just recently was um, uh, not elected, but she received the honor of being one of two delegates from Michigan to be part of the U.S. Senate Youth Program in Washington, D.C. So congratulations to her. She's, she's remarkable. Um, I also want to uh, thank Rex Cleary. Um, I passed out a letter tonight to all of you that speaks to Rex's continuing education in the area of um, facilities and, and whatnot in, in 90 hours of professional development, similar to what Miranda had not too long ago, a similar letter. And what it shows is our commitment in the district to professional development. Um, that's not just something we work on with our teaching staff. It's really for all of us, and it demonstrates in that level of leadership and um, professional development for them to keep their certifications um, straight and accurate. Um, also, we um, are talking more about artificial intelligence tomorrow. Kara Kelly Woodman from the teaching and learning team and Jay Grossman, director of technology, and myself, we're going to Michigan State for a large artificial intelligence summit because this is, districts really need to get a handle on how we're gonna approach this. Students are already using it. We need to make sure that we are properly working with artificial intelligence so that our students can um, be supported better in this area. So a number of updates, but thank you. Student representatives. Um, the first thing we wanted to say is that the Saloon High School Marching Band and Orchestra just came back from Disney, so we wanted to congratulate them. I heard it was super cool how they got to march and the orchestra performed at another part. Um, and then also the gymnastics team, we have our first meet before um, <laughs> break, so I'm super excited for that and our team. So that's all for me, but happy holidays. Mm, when is your meet? The 21st. Any particular time? 6 p.m. in the gymnastics room. <laughs> Thank you. For you to attend. And I just want to start off by saying that the Ecuador trip that me and other students went on was success. We completed the water irrigation system for the people in the neighborhood in Ecuador, which was super cool. And I want to thank Mrs. Denzin and Mrs. Trainer for running this program for students to be able to have the opportunity to go to different countries that need support, need community service, need help from people to help better their lives and their community as a whole is super cool. And they've been doing it for like 20 some years now, which is really, really cool. And I just want to say if anybody has the opportunity to go, definitely go. It was once a lifetime opportunity. It was super cool got closer to students and the teachers and learned a lot about different cultures and everything. And they're going back to Ecuador the first week of March. So if anybody's interested, definitely go. And I just want to say, hope everyone has a good holiday break, winter break, go see family, enjoy some, have some food and hopefully it snows on Christmas. I don't want no <laughs> green Christmas like the El Nino. past for some years. Don't let the next six days uh, dissuade you from that. So, um, I'm going to just leave it open to the rest of the board to chime in as they wish. Um, so I just got back from the Disney trip, and it was a great experience watching the kids march down. And uh, So that was really fun. I, I really want to give a shout-out to Principal Stagger, Nate, and uh, Lori Dawson for, I mean, that's just a small, just a few of the many that uh, put this event on, and it, it's a big undertaking I know the first airplane, I think, had some issues and yeah. they didn't take off for like three hours. Three, so, three you know, they had it set up where Principal Stagger was going to be there and the nurse was going to be there before anybody else got there. And they were the last ones there, you know. So <laughs> no matter how much planning you do, there's still a lot going on. So it was really impressive and fun to watch the kids. 
Yeah, I wrote down the same thing about admins and parents and teachers and people who supported the band. What a cool thing to see mm -hmm. on Facebook and on social media. Like, they represent us really well, right? So uh, I want to give a shout-out to Mateo over there, 100-point club member for the hockey team. So that's a pretty cool thing for, for him, and he was too humble to mention it himself. So there you go. And uh, I uh, want to wish everybody a, a great winter break. Like, I hope we get rest and relaxation and able to unwind and spend time with our families and our favorite hot chocolate recipes and all of that. So uh, happy winter break. Well deserved. I uh, just wanted to take a moment to... Um, to remember uh, Reese Mitchell, who was a student in um, our young adult program. And um, Reese was a beautiful soul who um, shared his love of many things, including um, Detroit uh, professional teams. And I had the privilege of becoming a part of, um, I guess, the Mitchell's people when I had um, Reese's younger sibling in first and second grade, and that is how I met Reese and got to know Reese. Um, and I, over the years, enjoyed um, hearing about um, his sense of humor, his love of the Big Lebowski, and um, many, many other um, things. His love of especially his um, campy, his grandpa, who had a very special relationship but I want to remember Reese and um, his peers at the Young Adult Program and his family. And I also want to celebrate his, um, the donation that his family has made to the Concussion Legacy Foundation via the CTE Center of Boston University in the hopes that um, a lot can be learned um, about the condition that Reese um, that took Reese from us and from his family. And so I just want to, um, to honor that gift. And I also want to um, invite everyone to keep the Mitchells and their family and Reese's um, beloved friends in their thoughts um, throughout this season, especially. Thank you. Um, I guess I, I'll start with my, my previous comment about the courses that will be added to the catalog um, when we talk about community leadership and I talk about possible guests in our community, Carolina Mateo are in that group. Um, last meeting we talked about the town hall for the Black Student Union and cooperation and partnership there. We heard about Ecuador tonight, so um, let's not forget about our student-led voices when we think about these new programs as well. I wanted to thank the finance team. We did not meet today. Uh, we got a little break, but Miranda, Steve, Tim, and Brad, thank you for the um, brainstorming and the cooperation and the collaborative conversations and um, respect that we always have in each meeting. I appreciate that. Um, I loved watching the videos of the Disney Magic Kingdom. I wanted to be there so bad, so I'm so um, I'm so thankful that all of the students um, that went had a good time and got home safely. Um, I was able to see Kara Stemmer's uh, open house for the consortium. It was packed. I was trying to figure out, like, how do I take pictures to show how many people are actually in the commons right now and down the hallway? Super, super impressed. It was the first one I was able to get to, and. Um, um, got to talk with a lot of folks, community members, students, and, and parents, so that was wonderful. Today was our last Foundation for Saline Area Schools meeting of the year. Um, last month they did $54,000 in grants for our buildings and for our staff, and several others were passed today. There is more money on the table, so um, just an advertisement to our, our buildings and our staff to please apply for those grants. Um, and then lastly, wishing everybody a very fun and very healthy, I know there's a lot of stuff going around right now, very healthy holiday season. Thank you. Oh, I've talked a lot tonight, but yes, happy holidays. Um, enjoy your, your time off and uh, yeah. Uh, I was also going to shout out the band and the orchestra um, group. 
Um, and I, since it actually is Hanukkah tonight, the sixth night, I will uh, wish anyone celebrating like I am a very happy Hanukkah. I really don't have a lot to report. Thank you. I really don't have a lot to report, except if you're out tomorrow night and the skies are clear, keep your eyes to the skies. The uh, Geminids are about, and you may see some pretty cool things. Um, let's go on to the consent agenda now. Uh, it is listed in this agenda and will not be read aloud. The motion noted will allow for the authorization of all listed items without discussion unless a member of the board requests that any one or all be considered individually. I'd like to entertain a motion to authorize a consent agenda as printed. So move, Stebbin. Stebbin. Support Miller. Support Miller. The J's have it. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, we have the consent agenda. Uh, item scheduled on the next agenda, Dr. Lodge. The primary scheduled report will be the strategic council update. Thank you. Public com Are there any public comment? No, hey. Skip, 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 check, check. The next meeting will be held on January 9th, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. This will include or begin with the organizational meeting and be immediately followed by the regular meeting. I'd like to entertain a motion to enter closed session of the Board of Ed at 9.05 uh, with the, well, let's say 9.10, uh, with the intent of uh, re-entering um, by you know, two in the morning. What do you think? No. Okay. <laughs> no, 10 or so, 10 or so, it all depends on how chatty we are, uh, roughly 10 p.m. Uh, for the purpose of superintendent evaluation, a, a, Section 8A, under say, Section 8A, a simple majority vote is sufficient to enter into a closed session. Um, do we have a mover? Yeah. Is that motion? Motion Gerby. Support, East Up. Thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. And who, those of you, those of you in the audience, are you okay, Mr. Fan? You, you yeah, okay. Oh, I'll show you where it is. Okay. There will be, a, thank you very much. There will be action at the end of this. We will be reviewing the superintendent's evaluation, uh, reading it into the record and voting on it. Thank you.
For the record, hello, we've returned. I'm going, for the record, we have had uh, a review of Superintendent Lodge's uh, performance over the year. And um, following and using the uh, Michigan Association of School Boards uh, Superintendent Evaluation Form, uh, which we've used many times before. What I'm going to do, for those of you keeping score and transcribing at home, is I'm going to read uh, the major headings in each of the tabs and the score that we gave, which is a rating out of four points, okay? So um, buckle up. So under governance and board relations, policy involvement, we rated a 3.39. Under goal development, we rated a 3.64. Under information, we rated a 3.39. Under materials and background, we rated a 3.57. Under board questions, we rated a 2.93. Under board development, we rated a 3.36. Overall, that came to a rating of 3.38, and that scores is a weight of 20% overall. On to the next one. Community relations. Uh, for parent feedback, we rated uh, Dr. Lotch a 3.36. Communication with the community, a 3.39, again, out of four. Community feedback, 3.39. Media relations, 3.64. Uh, district image, 3.75. Approachability, 3.75. And that overall was 3.55 with a weighting, weighting of 15%. Going on to the third of five tabs, staff relations. Uh, under staff feedback, we rated Dr. Lotch a 3.4. Staff communications, 3.6. Personnel matters, 2.9. Delegation of duties, 3.6. Recruitment, 2.7. Labor relations, bargaining, a 3.5. Visibility in the district, a 3.9. Overall, this was a score of 3.38, which was weighted at 15%. Under the business and finance, uh, we, uh, budget, <coughs> pardon me, budget development and management, we rated a 3.7. Budget reports, 3.7. Financial controls, 3.9. Facility management, 3.9. Uh, facility, uh, resource allocation, 3.6. This averages to 3.8, and the weighting is 20%. Under the last tab, second to last tab, under instructional leadership, uh, we have performance evaluation system, a 3.6, building level leadership, 3.8, staff development, 3.4, pardon me, 3.4, school improvement, 3.8, curriculum, 3.4, Instruction, 3.5. Student feedback, 3.4. Attend student attendance, 3.8. Support for students, 3.3. Professional knowledge, knowledge 3.8. That averages out to 3.58, and that is rated, uh, weighted at 30%. There are a few more tabs to go, though. Um, we also had to uh, examine other required components, our progress towards district-wide goals out of a rating of four. We, oh, sorry, I skipped one. Uh, under student growth, using a variety of factors, we came with the number 3.5, um, which is uh, between effective and highly effective. And finally, under progress toward district-wide goals, which is a weighting of 10%, we rated uh, Dr. Lotch's efforts at 3.75. Overall, compiling all those scores, we were a, a hair higher than last year, but still at 89%, which is a ranking of effective, at the very highest uh, edge of effective. Um, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve this uh, summary report. Was that so moved by Gerby? Support. Supported by Stebbin. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, any discussion first? No. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Then I will write this up, and if anyone needs any details about this, that should be available within a day or two, including our notes and comments by the superintendents. And uh, uh, how do we... How do we close these board meetings again? We say, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. Support, or a motion. Miller. 
Is that Tim? Austin. And Tim Austin. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Thank you very much. We'll see the next meeting will be on uh, January 9th. Thank you. 11.03. Oh, 11.